Evening, everybody. I'm Roy Epstein. <coughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Hold on. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, Roy Epstein, Chair of the Belmont Select Board, calling our meeting to order on September 25th, 2023 at 7 p.m., joined by Vice Chair Elizabeth Dion. Good evening, everyone. And Member Mark Paylillo. Good evening, everyone. And Town Administrator Patrice Garvin. Good evening. And Assistant Town Administrator Jennifer Hewitt. Good evening. And some number of people in the audience and virtual, and welcome all. Um, <clears throat> let's see, we have actually some interesting news. I'm not going to give it away now, but uh, there'll be some interesting news later this evening. Um, let me start with uh, community announcements. Are uh, they going to be shown on yeah, the screen? Yeah. 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 Uh, on Thursday evening this week, September 28th at 7 o'clock, uh, the select board is going to be hosting a what we're calling a public input session on the uh, fiscal 2025 budget. Uh, you can either attend live at the select board uh, conference room or virtually, uh, where the main goal, we, we will give a very brief presentation on the budget, but the main goal, as in our other um, uh, sessions of this sort is to solicit public uh, questions and comment. Um, we've gotten a number of comments already that this particular event conflicts with a number of other uh, school committee or school community events Thursday night, which we were aware of. Unfortunately, the calendar is just so crowded, we decided to proceed with this anyway. Um, and we'll have more events later in the fall, so this is not your only opportunity, certainly, to speak about the budget. Uh, this meeting will be treated as a select board meeting on Thursday, so it will be recorded, and you're welcome to watch the video in Belmont Media Center. And if you have any questions or comments you'd like to relay to the select board, we hope, you do, we hope you'll do so. Um, Second announcement is Belmont Light as a celebration. Our light department is celebrating its 125th anniversary on Monday, October 2nd. Uh, you can join everybody at Belmont Light uh, Headquarter Building at 40 Prince Street from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, That's incredible. Yeah, I'm not sure what. Oh, you can touch a truck. If you didn't touch a truck in Belmont Center, you can touch a truck at Belmont Light. You can dress as a line worker. Uh, I don't know if you climb a pole, but you can at least dress as a pole. <laughs> and there'll be safety demonstration and kids' activities, and they say much more. So that's uh, October 2nd. 1898, that's, that's impressive. It's incredible. It's incredible. Uh, some of the infrastructure is uh, mm -hmm. from 1898. Uh -huh. um, and finally, the townwide yard sale, which had been scheduled for this past Saturday it was postponed due to weather it will be uh, will take place on Saturday September 30th so that's uh, the end of this week uh, please visit the rec department website to view the map there are over 100 participating households and Patrice this does, does this mean there's still time to sign up or is it closed you might not be on the list that's being circulated, but I'd have to find that out. They, they need to call the rec department. Uh, so the it's rec department, not the town clerk. Okay. So if you're interested in adding your household to the hundred that are already participating, uh, contact the rec department this week and uh, they'll tell you what you need to know. How many are there going to be? They say over a hundred. Yeah, I've seen lots more. That's yeah. great. Yeah. That's great. Um, Okay, uh, next on the agenda is comments from town residents uh, for items that are not already on the agenda. Are there any, uh, please come to the microphone, identify, your, identify yourself or raise your Zoom hand. Uh, good evening, one second. Yeah. Just ran, just ran up the stairs. <laughs> 27 Lemoyne Street, Belmont. Um, Excuse me for being out of breath. Um, first, I want to give a, you know, we just had Town Day. It was a big success this weekend. And I, I want to give a shout out, shout out to two things here. One is uh, 
Um, Belmont Pizza was just put on the map um, on August 25th, which is a big day. I don't know if anybody here knows about David Portnoy and Barstool Pizza. Yeah. Anybody? Yes. Okay. It just got an 8.1, which is huge. And pizza's good. That is the number 11 in the state, number 81 in the country out of a thousand places. Yeah. So I want to give a shout out to that. But, but with that being said, I started working there in September of 68. It's been around for 55, 56 years. I would like to see the town recognize businesses that have been here over 50 years. Maybe do a list, go out and recognize these families or whoever put their hard work in to keep these businesses going in this town. That's a good idea. And uh, I know Cambridge has done it. I have some printouts in that, but uh, if you need them, I'll be glad again. Next is, um, I have a bunch of things, but um, on May 25th this year, um, <coughs> Mark Peel at one of the selectmen's meeting pointed out about school safety strongly. He mentioned, uh, what's that place in Texas? The, the school shootings? Evaldi. What? Evaldi. Evaldi. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I know this school safety is paramount. And a um, little history on that. Several years ago, well, over 10 years ago, my wife works at Burbank. It was a summertime. And she asked me to bring her something. And I don't know if anybody knows Burbank School. You have to enter through the side door. Yeah. OK, and it's a way, long way in yeah. to the school. She's been there for over 30 years. So I brought her into it. And in the summertime, Dave Frizzell used to bring in the um, workers from the prisons. So my wife now, she's the only one in the school. Doors wide open. Anybody can walk in that school, OK? I walked in and said, whoa. So anybody, not just the prisoners, anybody can walk in that school and, and attack her back then. I got on the phone to the school department and I brought it up to them. And that's when the school safety started in this town because they had no idea. And then Channel 5, I think, came out and did like a, a report, a sting. Hey, Ron, Ron, could I ask you to um, so anyways, cut to the chase? Okay, I'm going to go. This whole package right here, back in 2018, I brought up to the selectmen in the town about no cameras. This is when we had the old high school. We had no safety, all these shootings going on. We had no safety in town. Okay, now with that being said, um, let me get this out. Watching TV and news the other night, well, a couple of weeks ago. I don't, um, I know, like you mentioned at the meeting, we're one of the best for our town, any town for school safety. And um, there is, I don't know if you know about the, what's out there. Anyone ever hear a 9-11 inform? Ron, let me let me maybe uh, interrupt you for a moment. Any, anything involving the school buildings and the administration of yes. the school is is not the select board at all. It's okay, but I'm, maybe school this, is, this is a security system. Nine eleven. But but if, if it involves, if you're talking about some change to be made to the schools, you need to bring it before the okay. school. Okay, bring it up the school committee. Yes, we'll do. Okay. And the same thing like with uh, all the geese on the, on the field. Anything with the school grounds. Okay. Okay. All right, because they have dogs that do that better than anything. Yeah, no, my dog has chased the geese. What's that? Um, look, understand that the select board, nothing is more important than the safety of oh. our kids. Nothing. Yeah. And so we're committed to support whatever the school administration, the school committee wants to do around public school okay. safety. And um, I know my three minutes of clock's ticking. Yeah. No, you'll be on three minutes. <laughs> one, one, yeah, four. <laughs> one last thing. Yeah, you're like at five minutes. Yeah, one last thing is tonight you're going to talk about um, the um, Belmont Center, the outdoor dining. I think that's on deck. And with that being said, I know that um, the bike lanes are very important in town, or any town, and the safety in bike lanes. Bike lanes to me is like trying to put chlorine in half the pool, because they're not everywhere. Um, but with that being said, um, there was so much talk in Concord Ave about the bike lane safety. But if you go to Belmont Center, I'm all for outdoor dining, but all those, a lot, 50% of those Bike lanes are taken up by barriers. They're all in the That's bike on tonight's lane. agenda. What's that? That's on tonight's agenda, so you need yeah, to that's right. oh. Okay, well, actually, why don't you hold that, hold that thought oh, until, until we get to the agenda. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm on my, past my time. Thank okay. you, Ron. No, thank you. <laughs> all right, I see um, there are 
number of other hands. Uh, um, virtually, Judith uh, Ananian Sarno, her hand raised. Hi, um, am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, thank you. Judith Anani and Sarno, a Midtown meeting member in Precinct 3. Quick question about Thursday's budget forum. Can you make the slides available ahead of time uh, online? That would be helpful. Uh, if, if they're drafted, if they're yes. drafted, we'll post them. So do I need to... Where would I look and can I call somewhere tomorrow? To we'll post them online. They'll be online, Judith. We'll put them on the we, we were talking about having a um, a page on the on the town website devoted to the budget. Yep. Uh, where will we advertise that? We'll put the, the presentation on the, the slide banner on the on the front. Yeah, so you so you'll see something on the home page, Judith, as, as soon as you get to the town home website. Thank you. Thank you. If I could, just the timing on that will likely not be available until Thursday, Thursday afternoon. afternoon. Yep, Thursday afternoon. Okay. Okay. Uh, anybody else in the room who would like to make a comment? Yeah, I see that. Okay, next is uh, virtually Sheila Flewelling. Thank you, Roy. My question is, there's an agenda item later on about Newport construction, and I wonder if you will take public comment at that time regarding that issue. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right, and final comment from Matt Taylor. Matt. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for uh, recognizing me. This is Matt Taylor, uh, town meeting member, precinct one. Uh, I also wanted to talk about the budget forum uh, coming up this week. Um, when we, we hold these forums, especially on the budget, I think we have an opportunity to better inform people about the decisions that they are about to face. Uh, I think oftentimes we begin with things like an overview of the budget process and the history of how we got here. And from talking to our residents, that's not what they're itching to hear about. Uh, what they really want to hear, instead of a summary of the budget process, is they want to know specific key information. What is the specific key information? Specifically, when will it be presented, or when will it be known, or when will it be used? They'd like to see a date on the calendar. Uh, they would like to know these moments well in advance. One of the challenges of talking about the budget, even last year, was uh, information dripped out and it evolved over time. And so as people circled, you know, were available to pay attention to the conversation sooner or later, uh, it became confusing because they would talk to each other and they heard different things. Um, also knowing when these key moments are doesn't necessarily mean a vote. It could be before what later looks like the result of a backroom discussion. And in talking to our neighbors uh, and our, my fellow residents, uh, the appearance of backroom discussions uh, is driving them nuts. Um, the neighbors I've spoken with generally I understand. Well, I, I actually, Matt, Matt, can I ask you what that I, is? I, I, actually, I, I don't want to get involved with that at the moment. Matt, Matt, this is the first of quite a number of meetings. We are going to start with a very, very basic overview of the budget because uh, I think for many residents and new residents, uh, that will be new information. But the goal is to actually have them ask their own questions and we will respond to their own questions as best we can on Thursday night and for all the other forums. So there's no, um, there's no scripted program beyond the introductory comments on Thursday. And uh, this use of the term backroom deal that you've also raised before, I, I think is inappropriate unless you can be Unless you want to raise something on Thursday with more specifics, I'd ask you to please um, yeah, not true. cast such aspersions on and what we, we do we here. We put the calendar online as well, so we'll, we'll know when um, the specific, I think the specific dates will be available as well when we're meeting. Yeah, and the presentation does have a timeline. Okay, good. That's helpful. Um, may, I, may I finish the rest of my comments? If, if you're very brief, yes. Okay, I've been speaking for 90 seconds. All right. The. The neighbors I, I've spoken to genuinely want to understand 
why we are in the situation we find ourselves, to hear that this is structural due to legacy zoning and a low commercial brace, uh, base. They want to see and hear how there has been no negligence, no sloppiness, no kickbacks, no picking winners or losers, no self-serving decisions. Um, we also present information often as a list of bullet points and then read those bullet points to the audience. And this is effective for someone who will read the slides later, but it's ineffective for anyone who shows up. And I hope, you know, one way we can better this is to present context and content visually and perhaps the speaker's notes alongside. Um, we also often show tables with numbers and as a Warren Committee member and as a group, we <laughs> seem to like those tables in detail. Um, but from my you know, discussions with my fellow residents, uh, they're really struggling to navigate these tables. Um, and we often tend to, uh, during the presentation, talk the audience through the table, but that doesn't help those who are reading the presentation later. Uh, and one trick I've used here is to have a visual with one clear point, and then you can include the table later. Um, I've learned a lot about our budget and the budget process, both being on the warrant committee and building a budget visualizer, sharing it with residents and gathering feedback and I think this is gonna be a critical step for us, getting feedback and meeting with our residents where they are during their busy lives. For example, there's no good time to hold a budget forum. Uh, Thursday night is the Burbank uh, curriculum night. And so one of our seven schools will- hey, Matt, excuse me, Matt, you, we, we, Matt we've gone, Matt, excuse me, we've, we've gone past a minute and a half. And let me just yeah. underscore- hey, Thank you for listening. Let me just underscore that the primary goal, at least, for me on Thursday night is to hear from the public. And if people have questions, we, we hope that they will attend and ask the questions. If they can't attend, I hope they will send us an email with their question and we'll try to address it. But the, this, the, the goal is to have this shaped by the participants uh, more than anything. Um, and with that, uh, and then we'll have further um, forums uh, on later dates, but that, that's how we're going to start on Thursday night. Um, okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is town administrator's report. Thank you. Uh, two quick items. As the board knows, the Landed Street Outdoor Dining um, was again approved by the board this year. Your original vote was to extend it to Monday, October 30th. We received a request um, Friday of last week to potentially break down that earlier. That was a request from the uh, Belmont Center Business Association, uh, Jerry Dickow. They would like the breakdown of this um, outdoor dining to be on October 2nd instead right. of October 30th. I, from our conversations that Mike Centro had with Jerry, the weather has not been very cooperative this year. So they are looking to break down earlier. But the restaurants love being open, having an outdoor dining. <laughs> this is a good request. Yeah, if, if, if the restaurants are requesting it. I, I asked multiple times. No, it's um, not the Belmont Center Business Association. I mean, I guess they're restaurant members, but it doesn't, should they? Uh, it would include the restaurants. I was informed that Mr. Dickout reached out to all the businesses on, on that corridor. I, I thought he was the one of the primary uh, spokespeople for doing this in the first place. Yep. So I- But there have, been, there have been instances in the past where someone had spoken- We had closed it 30 days earlier? Mm -hmm. No, Mark, would you, do you want more? Uh... I would like to hear from the restaurants, yeah. I mean, they love it. And the residents do as well. And, you know, perhaps the month of October uh, will be inclement and colder where they put heat pumps out there. I wouldn't mind hearing from some of the restaurants, if you, if you don't mind. My colleagues? Uh, I mean, you know, I respect Jerry and his point of view here, but... but uh... Well, t so October 2nd is uh, Monday next week. We won't be meeting for a so... while. I'm not willing to agree to it. If you guys want to go for it, that's fine. You can make a contingent. I would make a contingent. On what? Uh, on hearing from a majority of restaurant no, owners. I'm not going to vote for it. I'll be I'll vote no. I mean, look, um, the residents appreciate it as well. And, you know, I respect Jerry immensely and the work that the Belmont Center Business Association has done. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are other non restaurants who would like to see those barriers removed. I get that. Mm -hmm. Okay because they believe it impacts their businesses. And I appreciate that and understand their concerns. But the restaurants love it. That, that was my initial what, thought. What, what, that's what why the, I asked the DPW director to, to verify. We voted October 30th because that's the input that we had received yep, previously. That's right. Well, what, what exactly did Jerry tell you? 
this isn't this is third hand information. This is from Mike Center, who had a conversation with Jerry. And my understanding is, given just the abysmal season of weather, they would like to close on October 2nd. When I asked whether or not this, this was actually speaking for all the businesses, I was told that it was. Well, I mean, that's, spoken to that's, all. Give, that's just a throwaway sort of yes, right? I mean, yeah. All right, Mr. Chair, if I may. Sure. I'm sorry. Uh, we have a meeting Thursday night. I mean, the agenda hasn't yet been posted. We could add this as a it's, topic if you don't mind. That's, I, I think that's perfectly that's fine. acceptable. I, I would like to hear from the major restaurants in the town, the center of town, as to their point of view on this. Okay. Yeah, we, can't I, pull I all the, we can't pull all the residents, right? No. And so we can't do that. But the restaurants understand what their business looks like and whether folks have been attending. Look, it's been raining constantly all summer, right? We get right. it. And the weather is turning. It's cooler at night. They have heat, you know, lamps out there. If the majority of the restaurants are fine with it, then I'll vote for it. Do you agree with that? I, I think it's fine. As long, as long as we're not leaving it hanging until we meet. I'm fine. On Thursday night, Mr. Chair, is it okay with you? Uh, Patrice, can you notify uh, the restaurants on Leonard Street? Yeah, that I'll try to reach out. It's their night, too. Uh, tell us the name. Express. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and then finally, Jennifer provided a, an update on some borrowing uh, that the town is going to be moving forward with. This is just a calendar or a timeline of how that's going to happen. Uh, it's really an opportunity for you to kind of see what we're thinking if you had any questions for Jennifer. Would you, would you mind walking, Ms. Chair? Yeah, yeah with Jennifer, are Can you, you referring to a particular on the screen we can walk to a particular table? Please. Let's see, you know, I think I do. Um, this is for the I think it was in. The project? No, it's for, it's for both. Really? It's for both. It's for both the library and the library. So is it just the calendar that's included? Here? Yes. Yes, that's it. Right. That's it. Here, I can do it. I, can do it. I, mean, I, I had no questions, but I'm also, it's not my area of expertise. Well, so, you know, rather than showing, sharing the calendar, I don't think that that's. So it, it, it is just a calendar. I, it is just a calendar. I think what, what the, the, ba the main focus is, is just that. Um, in talking with our advisors and looking looking at the needs of the of both projects going forward, it's uh, we are going to need more than just the advanced borrowing that you authorized at, your, at our last meeting, and so just I um, it does there is lead time to issuing the debt you know on the market, and we have to prepare an official statement and do some other some other areas and. Um, we would, you know, if we were looking to get some funding in November, December timeframe, the ideal time, just from our perspective, with so many other things that are going on right now, would be ideal to to go to market so that we can receive the funds on November fifteenth. Backing up from that, we would we would actually sell the debt uh, on October twenty fifth, and so then that means that we would be bringing it to a select board meeting on October 30th for you to approve that sale. Um, what we are talking about doing at this point is issue, issuing notes to get us through for, for a year and then we would end up, we would either um, refinance those notes and add additional notes to that next November or we might decide at that point to issue permanent debt. One of the benefits of doing a note at this point is that we're simply paying for the interest next year and where we are expecting an override, it would be helpful to, to lessen the blow on the individual taxpayers. So that is what our strategy is at this point, is to, um, is to issue notes for what we anticipate we would need for the next year. We'd only go out once and then go out again next November as well. Do we anticipate a stable interest rate environment up, down? You know, my one question about the year. It's it's very difficult to say, and next year is an election year as well, so that also makes it difficult. And I think the um, it, people have been talking about a soft landing, um, but there's a lot that could imperil a soft landing. Um, what are the rates today? They for a long term note, it would be in the four four and a half percent. For a, for a long term note, we're currently projecting about a 5% if we were to go to, to sale next year, but that's just so, simply so we can be conservative. It would be, it's a lot better to come in less than to, to come in higher. What's our consultants advising? 
Um, they're advising that we do what's best for the town. Um, of course. You know, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> no, but, but, so, <laughs> that being said, I think that with, in terms of the, um, what I mean by that is that, you know, where we have the, the needs of the taxpayers. So by issuing um, a note, it's about a $900,000 savings on debt service next year, oh, good. Okay. which is um, well, that's great. Because, yeah. it's, because it's interest only. Because it's interest only. Yeah. That's right. And so then that that um, translates into about $126 for the average single family home okay. for next year, next year's. Um, but, but we incur two rounds of issuing costs. Or? Well, it, the, the issuing costs are considerably less when we only go out for notes. So that is one of the reasons for doing that as well. And we'll also be rolling in the high school, um, the remaining amounts of the high school that we will also have to be financing through notes until we get the final reimbursement for the MSBA. Okay. I see. Well, that, well, uh, I see. So, the, so the, total, the total amount, if this, so this is the rink, the library and the high school? There. It is just a portion of, of those amounts. It's the amounts that we that based on the initial cash flows that we right. will be needing until we go out to, to market again next November. But they they would uh, some portion would be devoted to all three projects. That is correct. And those numbers, I'm still work, need to work. I'm working with the projects to kind of refine their numbers, so as I would not want to issue more debt than we needed to. Okay, Fine. that makes sense because the I mean the high school also has a cash flow gap that needs to be covered also. Good work, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Bob Bond Council thinks this, this schedule is workable, I take it. Um, we are interacting with Bond Council and sharing our notes and, and um, Alan Cushman was incredibly helpful to just gather some data over the summer so that we are five steps ahead. Oh, okay. All right, sounds good. That's just an announcement. There's no action. Nope, we're just letting you know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next item is a uh, proclamation for National Senior Center Month. Didn't know there was such a month. Um, we have a number of representatives uh, from. Um, when, when do we get to talk about the uh, outdoor dining you said it was coming up? Thursday night. Thursday night, Ron. Thursday night? Very right. Yeah. It's been. It's been Oh, which time would that be? Ron, I, 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 I wanted to get, we wanted to get additional feedback from the restaurant, so it's now scheduled for Thursday night before the- uh, it'll, be, it'll be first thing Thursday night. Okay, thank you. Can I, Mrs. Sacker. Um, before I leave, I just want to give a shout out to um, uh, Pam and James and the Selectman's office. They are huge assets. I go to them and they uh, can't do enough for you. And the same thing with Ellen's office to, uh, Dan, Jack, and Nancy. Here, here. Yes. We, we agree, Ron. We, we do agree. Yes. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> oh, here's the proclamation. All right. I <clears throat> thought we had one electronically. Uh, Roy, we also have a public hearing at 7.30. Oh, my goodness. Um, These folks are waiting to hear the proclamation. Well... Uh, we can. I think we've done this before, Mr. Chair, where we open the public hearing and then we move to um, table it. Yeah. That, that would work. Uh, and it's 7:29, so let's. Sorry, everybody. This some um, unexpected, uh, unexpectedly long comments earlier today. You can open up the public hearing and then we take a motion to table it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Until after your business. I'm here for the public hearing. That may just be Craig. J. You. You Tim. Tim Pagrelli. No. All right, 7.30. Um, so I'm going to open the public hearing um, to consider the grant of location petition from Belmont Light to locate poles, wires, and fixtures along Waverly Street and Beach Street as part of a Station 1 conversion project. It's the public hearing on 
September 25th, 2023 at 7.30. Uh, so I declare the hearing open. And Mark, you Mr. want to move? Chair, yeah, I move to table uh, the public hearing to consider the grant of location petition from Belmont Light to locate poles, wires, and fixtures along Waverly Street and Beach Street as part of the Station 1 conversion project. Um, subsequent to the um, reading on the uh, reading of the proclamation for National Senior Center Month. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, Elizabeth, you want to read the proclamation? Surely. Whereas older Americans are significant members of our society, investing their wisdom and experience to help enrich and strengthen our community, and whereas the Beach Street Center has acted as a catalyst for mobilizing the creativity, energy, vitality, and commitment of the older residents of Belmont, and whereas through the wide array of services, programs, and activities, the Beach Street Center empowers older citizens of Belmont to contribute to their own health and well-being and the health and well-being of their fellow citizens of all ages, and whereas during the pandemic, the Beach Street Center has been a community partner in ensuring that our most vulnerable citizens, people ages 60 and older, many with underlying medical conditions, are cared for and able to stay connected, safe, and healthy. And whereas the Beach Street Center affirms the dignity, self-worth, and independence of older persons by facilitating their decisions and actions, tapping their experiences, skills, and knowledge, and enabling their continued contributions to the community, now therefore, be it resolved that the Select Board of the Town of Belmont proclaims September 2023 National Senior Center Month and calls upon all citizens to recognize the special contributions of the Beach Street Center participants and the special efforts of the staff and volunteers who work every day to enhance the well being of the older citizens of our community. Select Board Roy Epstein Chair, Elizabeth Dion Vice Chair, Mark A. Palillo Member, dated September 25, 2023. Thank you. So, would anybody like to speak about the? Please identify yourself. Uh, Dana Bickelman, director of the Beach Street Center, and I just wanted to. Good. How are you guys? Great. I wanted to say thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity. Um, September is National Senior Center Month, and so it gives us an opportunity to shine a light on everything that we do. Um, and really highlight all of the programs and uh, wonderful benefits that we bring to the community. So I wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you for all your uh, good and diligent work. Yeah, I hear great things about the programs down there, Dana. So thank you very much for your efforts. We really, we really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We want to present this to Dana? Uh, 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 how do we, who, who gets the, we want to post it at the Senior Center, right? Yeah, what becomes of it? Yeah. The, Dana can take it. And, yeah, and then we can frame it. Oh, uh, yeah. Sure. Frame it. <laughs> Congratulations, Dana. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great work. You know, the senior center for many seniors in town is one of the only things they have in their life. And so um, I learned that over the years and greatly appreciate all of the programs. I certainly appreciate the leadership and work of the Council on Aging supporting those programs and keep up the great work. And you have strong support from this board on, on doing more for our seniors in our community. Thank you. And I also wanted to say thank you to our board members for coming out and Absolutely. celebrating this. So, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dana. Good luck. Thank you. Take care. I'd also like to congratulate Dana on a, a terrific uh, beginning to her tenure as, uh, <laughs> as a, the leader of the senior center. All right. So I uh, move to uh, Mr. Chair, if you want. Uh, I think I have yeah, start. actually, if. Since the Leonard Street Transformer may actually be a logical follow-on, if we could just uh, quickly get Mike Widmer and take care of that, then we'll get back on track. Oh, good grief. Um, can we quickly do both items, the, uh, the uh, request from the First Church of Belmont and also the town meeting update? So the, uh, actually to get back in the order of the uh, original agenda, the next item is a request from the First Church of 
uh, First Church of Belmont and the Belmont Religious Council to use the town green for Belmont Serbs on October 9th, 2023 from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. And Patrice, is there anything special about the use of the space this time? No. Nope. It's a wonderful event. Frank here. I'm sorry. She yes. Was, well, she she was asked to be here. I don't see her there. I'm sorry. Oh, I don't see her. Uh, well, if there's nobody here to speak to this, I'm prepared to vote on it. Likewise. So I move to approve the request from the First Church of Belmont and the Belmont Religious Council to use the town green from Belmont Serves on October 9, 2023 from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, next is an update on the special town meeting from our town moderator, Michael Whitmer. Good evening, Mike. Good evening. How are you? Nice to see you. So my, um, <clears throat> Mike Whitmer had sent a letter to the select board and also the town meeting members, and this is to update and explain to the town as a whole what, what this is all about. Sure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Let me just make a few um, comments. Uh, I've given a lot of thought to this recommendation. I've talked to many, many town meeting members, other communities, and my recommendation, as you know, is to have essentially an in-person meeting, um, but with the opportunity for remote participation for individuals who have special circumstances. So it's not a traditional hybrid meeting, but at the same time, it accommodates the value of an in-person meeting. And all of the conversations I've had, almost everyone says, wow, meeting in person is much better than doing just a virtual meeting. When we had in the spring our first in-person meeting since COVID, one third of town meeting members had never been to an in-person meeting, and which is rather remarkable statistic in its own right. Yeah. And so many of them reached out to me and said, wow, I can see why the value of an in-person meeting, the quality of the debate, and the community building and so forth. So strong support for that. At the same time, clearly the COVID and the experience with uh, virtual meetings showed that there's an opportunity for access for a certain number of individuals who otherwise would not be able to attend town meeting in person. It's a small minority, but it's a real issue. And I think it's an important issue. So my recommendation is to try to balance the two. Have essentially, I hope, as I've said in my email and letter, a large town meeting in person. But for those with special circumstances, and I don't suggest that anybody please that, but that would be individual conscience, that they can come on remotely. And as I say, I hope it will be significant uh, vast, vast majority in person, but accommodating those who have circumstances. At the same time, we will retain the seats, the sections of the high school that we had in the annual town meeting for people who want to wear masks and are concerned about the uptick in COVID. So there was a section in the bottom and then the balcony. So we will also have that as well as a protection for individuals who want to attend in person but are concerned about uh, COVID or the flu or whatever. Um, we've had a preliminary meeting uh, at the high school with the uh, high school folks, IT, town clerk, myself, Jennifer was there to begin to scope out how it would work. We think we can manage it. It'll take some adjustment, of course, and to balance people standing in line on one hand and then raising their hand uh, virtually as well. But I think we can manage it. Um, and so that is my recommendation, which I think meets the needs, as I've laid out, of, uh, uh, of our town, town meeting members 
and uh, we'll ensure that we have a good debate on important issues at town meeting. Mike, I think the proposal is a good one. Um, it's also well-timed because uh, COVID may be a concern now that it was, that was not as much in the spring. Uh, nonetheless, I want to underscore what you've explained to me, at least, is this being an experiment? Yeah. And that uh, people should not view it as carte blanche to simply attend virtually. You should really have a, a bona fide reason where nobody's going to police it formally, but if, if attendance at the actual town meeting does not, if live attendance does not reach a, um, real, a significantly high level, a substantial majority of town meeting members, it's going to jeopardize ever doing this in the future. So uh, I think everybody should just treat it responsibly uh, in that light. Uh, it's a, preserve it as an option, but an option to be used uh, sparingly uh, if possible. I obviously wholeheartedly agree and my message to town meeting members tried to underscore that. Um, Michael, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, are you, from a numbers perspective, individuals that otherwise would attend virtually did not attend the physical meeting in the spring? Those that just stayed away? I mean, I forget what our accounts were. I don't. Know. Can I interject? The budget was shocking. We had roughly 200 people out of 288. That just seemed like yeah, a I huge... remember that, Elizabeth. On the third night. And yeah. we had 230 to 240. The yeah, I think that's right, Elizabeth. I remember that. And, and I just, of, of all the things that town meeting does, the budget is, is central. And so, you know, I'm not, I certainly did not place that list. I have not gone to look to see who was there and not there. I agree that this needs to be on an honor system and that we trust one another's goodwill. Um, I also think it's, it's the right thing to do and an important thing to do. But we, it feels to me like, you know, 88 out of 288 not attending is, is not a small minority. Well, I agree. It was the first two nights were 240, 250, something. They, they were, um, and then it dropped off the third night. But again, so how many of those, Michael, do you, I guess I don't know how, how you do this, but would have otherwise attended virtually because of their concerns? Because of, I don't know the number, Mark. Yeah. My, I mean, I've heard from a number of individuals. I don't know. I, I would say probably 12 to 15, or maybe have health issues. Others, I mean, there are some people who have trouble getting a sitter or dropped out at the last oh, that's a minute. That's exactly. understood. And that kind of thing. And then parents with young children, it's sometimes challenging to, to get And then the third issue is travel. So those are the three issues I hear about. <coughs> so I don't know the numbers, but uh, probably the 12 to 15 might be in the medical category, Mark. I can't help but, I mean, I agree with um, your comments, Michael, and of course, Roy's. Uh, it's an experiment and it's needed to accommodate those individuals that truly have concerns from a health perspective to be in that kind of an environment. Um, even though there are sections of the auditorium that they can sit with, with masks on, which should protect them, frankly. Um, the COVID is, you know, on the rise again during the fall months here. I worry that you'll have 100 people doing virtual meetings. <laughs> I do, Mike. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I have 100 that say, hey, I'm just going to, you know, back, uh, I mean, just folks are just going to say, look, it's just easier to attend virtually, particularly with, um, I guess, special town meeting warrant articles like the bylaws, which is so important. We believe we're committed to those as, as equally committed as to the budget matters because I think it changes. I think this is way as future. I'm sorry. Yeah. I think this is worth. Trying. Trying. Yeah. Okay. And I'm hopeful that town meeting members will understand the context and we'll see. But I think it's the right thing to do now. And if it doesn't work, we can, we can adjust. Are the communities doing this, Mike? Yeah, have you heard? Or I think in your email. They're doing, the they're doing. Yeah. One of the issues we face here that from a logistical point of view is we have probably the largest representative town meeting in the state. So we 300 people counting the at large almost. Others are 200, 150, 100. So they can more easily have a traditional hybrid meeting, if you will. Whereas, you know, we're much larger. So this it's more difficult for us. But other communities are doing hybrid meetings, yes. Okay. As Roy said, it's an experiment. We'll see how it goes and trust people's goodwill and integrity. Yes. 
Do we need anything to have a vote on this? No, this is all Mike's Mike's call. Well, I think well, yeah, just notifying us or well we have to put in the warrants the 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 way we write this because it's a hybrid, which we have to check with George because it's a hybrid, so it's a little different from the remote. But um I do believe you have to accept this. Well, why don't I say I move to support the town moderator's recommendation on uh, the fall town meeting to uh, conduct it in a hybrid manner. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all. Have a good Thank night. Thank you. All right. Uh, we can now take our public hearing from the table. I move to remove the um, public hearing to consider the Grant of location petition from Belmont Light to locate poles, wires, and fixtures along Waverly Street and Beach Street as part of the Station One conversion project uh, from the table. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So, Craig, is this you? It's actually me, Yancey Dato. Oh, hi, yeah. Please come to the microphone. Well, actually, come to the table and introduce yourself. Is this Spinelli going to join us as well? Or? Hi, I'm uh, Yatin Dagro, one of the uh, engineers at Belmont Light. Mm -hmm. and, nice to see you again. Welcome. And I'm Craig Spinelli, general manager of Belmont Light. Is Dr. O'Brien in the building? as well? Stop coordinating? No? Um, no, we were told late that he was okay. not able to. Sorry, Mr. Chair. All right, well, maybe you could just start with a brief overview of what this uh, sure. project is. Yeah, so. Um, um, uh, Belmont Light actually has existing lines that go down uh, Thomas Street as well as Waverly Street. I'm not sure if you received the plan that I submitted. Uh, yeah, it's, it's in our binder. And uh, I mean, if, if, it is, if it is this, that's it. Very that's correct. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it'll be easy to follow if I explain yeah. it. Uh, yeah, it's a little cryptic. <laughs> So as you can see on this plan, right on Thomas Street, on the north side of Thomas Street, we have an existing pole, it says existing pole seven, and then we have an existing pole on Waverly Street on the west side. Excuse me, let me interrupt. Sure. Can you, can you project this yep. screen? Yeah. We'll, we'll put it on the screen for the benefit yep. of the viewing public. Right there. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> you rotate it. I'm going to try. All right. All right. Please continue. Yep. So, as you can see on that plan, um, let me scroll up just a tiny little bit. Thank you. So, on the north side of uh, right of Thomas Street, there's an existing pole seven. We have existing lines that, that end there. And then we also have existing lines on Waverly Street. As you can see where it says existing pole 13 and we're trying to install a new line and connect those two lines, which is why we're requesting to install this pole, which is right at the intersection of Thomas Street and Waverly Street, which says proposed pole. And then the other pole that's going to be on Beach Street on the south side. That's more used for a guide pole to support the proposed pole that we're requesting at Thomas Street and Waverly Street. So this pole is necessary for several reasons. One of the reasons is actually to make the system more robust. We're also going to be able to improve reliability in the area by installing new lines. And then also it will relieve load off of station one, which is part of the station one conversion project. Let me see if I understand this. So there's an existing pole on the north part of on, on Thomas Street. Correct. And there's an existing pole at the corner of Beach and Waverly. Correct. Is, so the pole on Beach and Waverly is going to be moved or, or eliminated or a second pole was going to be installed there? That's the second pole. That's going to be supporting the proposed pole that I'm calling to install at Thomas and Waverly Street. And then the wires will cross Waverly Street? The what? I'm sorry. Will, will wires cross Waverly Street then at that point? Or is there a... It's not going to cross. It's actually just going to do like a 90 degrees. So it's going to come from pole 7. It's going to go to the proposed pole and then it's going to go to pole 13. So we're not eliminating any poles, we're adding poles. We're adding There's correct. There's a wire that's going across Thomas there? I'm sorry, where are we looking here? 
Can I point on the screen? Yeah, sure. Well, so what happens after from poll seven? Where is there a wire that then goes to the proposed poll? Poll seven. So there will be wires going to pro the proposed poll. Currently, there are no wires crossing from poll seven over to Waverly Street right now. The wires dead end at poll seven, and they also dead end at poll thirteen, and they kind of continue down. So those are existing circuits that we're trying to eliminate that come out of station one. So we installed a new circuit down Royal Road over to Thomas Street. So this new pole will allow us to install new lines from Thomas Street over to Waverly, and then we can eliminate our uh, the four kV feeders that are coming out of station one. So there will be a line that goes that will correct. There will be lines correct from Thomas Street going over to Waverly. Sorry. They're going to kind of do like a ninety degree angle right there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, well, I assume you wouldn't be asking for this if it weren't necessary and beneficial. So I'm not correct. sure I have anything to add that's productive to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm surprised that we have to have a public hearing for something like this. It's a location. It's, a it's what? It's a grant allocation. You have to have public hearing. Oh, I see. Okay. You need public comment. Can you have staff, Craig, uh, the Mitchell Light Board support this? Support this? Support this? The, um, so this uh, grant allocation, we did not bring this to the light board. Um, <clears throat> it's a grant allocation, so it's it's with the select board uh, as owners of the rights away. It's my understanding, actually, typically uh, Belmont Light as a town department um, wouldn't necessarily need to follow the grant of location, um, but it's not every day that we put new equipment in the public way, so we wanted to make sure we brought this. So the select board was not involved in this at all? Why wouldn't they have voted on this? I mean, I know we're voting grant the location, but but in terms of what we're doing and rewiring, wouldn't the municipal light board want to oversee that? Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. So that put in it? Just no? an operating decision. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's it's operating decision. Okay. Good point. All right. Um, given that it is a public hearing, it any comment from the public uh, on this proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess we notified all the opponents, right? Yes. Yep. I'll just wait another moment. Um, so is, is this just poles or are there also going to be transformer boxes or anything like that? Uh, uh, on this pole, it will just be just wires, <laughs> pole and wires. Okay. But, and no other, nothing else that has a footprint on the sidewalk? Just Correct. Okay. Yeah, just the means of, collecting, of connecting the pole from Thomas Street to the pole on Waverly Street. Street. All right, well, there are no uh, public comments. So, um, Please, can I just ask a brief question? Sure. Um, uh, it's not part of the public hearing, but are there still redundant poles in town? Uh, you mean the like double poles? Yeah. Yes. Um, so we are actively working on uh, Waverly Street. So right now there's um, several double poles on Waverly. What's the number in town, Craig? We know. Um, I do not know. You do you have I would say we've been pretty uh, good with uh, removing the double poles on our side. Our, as you know, the town is split into half. Half of the uh, town is set by Verizon because they own the poles. And then the other half is owned by Belmont Light set and uh, owned by Belmont Light. So when we replace a pole, like on Waverly Street, we will set the new pole and then we'll transfer our equipment. We'll wait for Verizon and the other uh, communications to transfer their wires onto the new pole. And then we remove the old pole. Whereas on the Verizon side, they set the pole and they're the last ones or they're the ones who remove the pole and they are way behind on removing the pole from their side. We are focused on it, yes. There's a, um, a email system that's been set up between all the utilities. So we notify each other every time a new pole is set. I of a former member of the board that I served with in 2010. So that's going back 13 years. Sure. One of his, uh, no, we, we, um, we, we try to stay on top of those. Uh, our, our, uh, the residents of Belmont, our customers, uh, usually keep us on our toes and will, will let us know when there's something that's been uh, out there for a long time. But between us with uh, talking with Verizon, we can usually get those moving pretty pretty quickly. One motion, Mr. Chair. No, I mean, also, I have one more question. So after you do this, is there still a lot more poll work necessary in order to be able to uh, complete the uh, the 15 kV and also the um, uh, decommissioning of station one. Yes, we have significant work still in front of us to uh, 
to, to continue our, our project of, of upgrading the voltage in town from the 4,000 volt the historical older voltage that we had to 13.8, which is our uh, newer voltage out of the new substation. Um, we have several years in front of us still and, and um, uh, an immense amount of work. As far as the particulars of that work, new poles versus um, existing poles, I, I'd be guessing at, at that number. Um, as we come across, as we design these circuits, we're, we're running into those uh, situations like this one where we'll find we need a pole here or not. But Belmont's pretty well built out, so I, I don't suspect there'll be a lot of new equipment that wasn't there before meeting poles. Um, but I'd, be, I'd honestly be guessing to give you an answer right now. All right, no other questions, take a motion. Uh, move to approve uh, the petition from Belmont Light for a grant of location to locate poles, wires, and fixtures along the following public way. Waverly Street, Belmont Light to install one sole owned pole, 85 feet east of existing pole number 13 located on the north side of Waverly Street and B, B Street, Belmont Light to install one sole owned pole, it's hard to say actually, and one sole owned anchor 45 feet south of existing aluminum pole number 15, which is located on the south side of Waverly Street. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Craig, good to see you again. Yep, I got one more. Can we get the transformer lead location? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, here. Okay. Yeah, who are we putting this baby? Uh, Glenn, are you part of this too? Um, want to be the, the Lemon Street transformer? Me. Maybe. Do okay. you want to be part of it? Do you want to be? Uh, yeah. uh, okay, look, come up with this. <laughs> well, you mean get into, get into this shorter than that. You get into the battle. I'm not trying to be coy or anything. I, I, I have what I think is good news for the conversation, but the get conversation the box in case you call. The conversation has to reach a certain point before my information is relevant. So that's why I'm. I'm uh, well, the issue here is, as people may know, there is a uh, transformer that was installed, uh, kind of split between the sidewalk and the street, 100 Street, uh, last year, sometime. Yes, it was a uh, very early spring. Because uh, I believe there was a flooding condition that took out the old transformer. And the, the transformer that's there is kind of an interim solution. And I gather tonight is a, um, is a, is a reworking of that to basically get it out of the way, because it's a little bit in the way right now. Yes, exactly. So um, as you just described, we, uh, earlier this year, we had several transformer failures. Uh, out in front of uh, this location, the uh, craft uh, air cellar there. Um, and so uh, upon the last failure of our equipment, we had to make uh, temporary repairs, emergency repairs by installing that pad mounted transformer above our manhole. Um, we, we did that uh, and while we were doing that, we had reached out to, through our network of, of um, contacts, uh, Northeast Public Power Association, which really uh, covers all the public power utilities in New England. Um, we also reached out, I reached out directly to Joe Nolan, the um, CEO of Eversource. We asked everyone that we could, did they have a transformer that we could then uh, reinstall in the, in the manhole? Uh, just to give you a sense of how we call these oddball transformers, meaning that they're kind of one-offs. They're not a common transformer. Eversource did not have any of these transformers and uh, not, no other public power utility in New England had one of these transformers. Um, it's just that it's the type and style of transformer really does not belong in the underground manhole. So, um, so this, this is a uh, rendering, yes. Um, is that, so, is that the scale? Seriously? Yes. That's going to be in the middle of Belmont Center, Craig? So if you could, it's, um, sorry. sorry. Yep, yep. If you go to, to slide two, if you don't mind. Please. Letting me look, I'll show you. The one the just I think you want to go up. <laughs> it's like a CGI dog. I think if maybe yeah, you see the renderings on the right side, like I think if you hit skyscrapers, it'll. 
eventually catch up to you. I'm sorry, Craig, I didn't react. No, it's okay. Um, yep. So, so if we sat down with the town departments, uh, Glenn Community Development, as well as the Department of Public Works about you know how to go about solving the problem we had, in particular the water issue that caused the failures in the first place. Um, and after those conversations, what we came up with was uh, the the black is the addition. I'm sorry that this drawing here doesn't have a, a legend with it, but um, so this is an overhead view from from above. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what we're proposing here is um, to extend the curb where the crosswalk is um, through the first parking space, if you will, and then place a pad mounted transformer there on the corner. Um, it does uh, several things that uh, we believe is, is to be the best design. First and foremost, it, we only lose one parking space in the center with this design. Um, the design or, or leaving the transformers in the underground vault requires that we raise that vault um, so that's not in the um, the gutter anymore, if you will. So we would have to literally bump the curb out. You would lose two parking spaces, and then we would have to you know raise that up. So in this design here, we're only losing one parking space. So we believe that's best for the. Uh, businesses in the in the Belmont Center area. Can I just interject? So the plan that would take two parking spaces, you would still have an above ground transformer, though. So the, no, in that case, the transformers would be below ground. Um, is there a price differential? There is. Yes, um, it's about um, one and a half times the cost of of this design. Because above ground is just ugly, given. I, mean, yeah, I, mean, I, I have to be honest with you. I, I, I can't support that size transformer so, on, our, so, on our town sidewalk. So in anticipation of, of this discussion, we met in my office. Um, and we talked about putting it underground. And there was a lot of hesitancy given some, of the, drain, given some of the drainage that's in that area. And that you could just be having the same problem in a few years. Patrice, this thing's enormous. I, I mean, it's enormous. It's in front of, it's, 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 this is ugly. For our town I center to sit there at that size transformer forever. We've, so the I appreciate the cut. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, yep. sort of the desire to try to manage costs, but from an engineering perspective, there's no other solution here other than to put this giant transformer on the sidewalk in the middle of Belmont Center that really affects the. Beautification of the center. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't. I can't well, let's, 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 let's back up for a second. What, so, what were the alternatives you considered? So, so there was raising the vault and. Yes. Yeah, so, so there was, you know, the first question we were asked by several people is, can you put it in the Clapham Street lot behind the building? Uh, we would have, would have loved to have done that. That was our preferred design when. Um, the, the owners of the building, the old Macy space, uh, the Locatelli Associates, when they remodeled that building, um, they had asked us to place these transformers on the Leonard Street side of town. Um, they considered that the back of their building and the Claflin Street lot, the front of their building. They, they asked us not to put a pad mount transformer in the front of their building. When they remodeled that building, they, re, they moved their electrical room from the Claflin Street side of the building to the Leonard Street on the back side. So at this point, putting a transformer in the Claflin lot does us no good because we can't get to our electric, well, the building's electric room, which is on the other side of the building. We would have to come up Alexander, take the 90 down Leonard Street and come in through Leonard Street. One thing I wanted, the reason why this drawing here I thought was uh, important to look at all those different color lines are utilities. The uh, light blue is the MWRA. They have uh, two 20 inch drain lines there. Um, <coughs> you can see this is virtually no space on Alexander Ave to do any digging, any kind of installation of conduit. Um, from a price, as some, you asked about the price of, of the other design, 
this was about four times as much to um, to install this conduit. And that's just a rough estimate. We expect it to be higher than that because of all the hurdles that we would have to go through with the digging company to get past all these different utilities. Right. So as much as we would all like to put it on Claflin Street or in the Claflin lot, we just don't have the ability to do that. Um, the only two designs that were practical was keeping it in the manhole that it's presently, uh, that the Padmon is sitting on top of, um, or moving it to the, to the corner. Uh, the next drawing, page three, was the other. Let me ask this question. How long will this transformer last? The Padmona transformer? Yeah, the one above ground. That should last yep, 20, 30 years easily. If you amortize the cost over 30 years, and, and you don't put it where it is and put it into a place that maybe costs more, I mean, that, you have to look at the cost per year. I don't think the residents of this community would want to see that giant transformer on that sidewalk. I'm sorry. Well, let's back up for a second, though. So, uh, Craig, you said before that even if you raised I'm sorry. and relocated the vault and put a transformer underground, I guess first doing it over again, could you get a more conventional design for a transformer, or would it still be this oddball transformer that you described before? So it would still be these oddball transformers. Um, again, they're a type of transformer that is typically not put in a underground vault. But, but there's there's no transformer intended for underground use that could be put in the vault, even if the vault, vault were rebuilt? Um, not this size. I mean, well, obviously we had existing transformers there, so we, we could have them manufactured that way, and that's what we did. We had transformers, the, the transformers that were in the vault, yeah. they should have lasted us 20 to 30 years. They lasted us five years because of the amount of salt and water that uh, pours into that vault. Um, so that was the, the problem with the, the existing design. To put those back, that's why we would need to bump the curb out uh, and that, that slide three takes basically two parking spaces away. Um, there are some concerns that we have. It was never the right design, quite honestly, from day one. But what happens is these transformers are so large that our personnel cannot go into the manhole. So we have to de-energize that vault for us to go down and work in that manhole. Um, not, that, we can commonly go into a manhole and work on our equipment when it's energized. In this case, we would not be able to. It's just too big of equipment. You, we can't have a person in the manhole safely moving around the equipment. It's just not, not possible. Um, the other downside to this type of installation for the businesses themselves, they're limited in their amount of load they can take from Belmont Light. So the size of these transformers are the maximum size that we can fit in there. So if the spaces are turned over and or other stores want to move in with a higher need for uh, electricity for power, um, we would not be able to supply it from uh, that service because these transformers are as, as large as they can be. Pad mountain transformer, we have the ability to upgrade um, to any size that that's required. But, but are you saying then that um, even if the vault were rebuilt, that there's no suitable equipment to go in the to go in the vault that would, I guess, meet the demand plus be serviceable in the, in the way that you would like it to be. We would have to. We would have the the transformers that were there that failed. We would have those remanufactured, uh, purchase new ones and, and place them in. That's what we would have to do. Um, but we we left with the same hurdle that we found this time is. Uh, because those are what we call, again, oddball transformers, we have to buy more than what's needed and keep those in our stock yard so that if we have another problem, we're able to take a transformer and replace it. Um, that's perfectly fine, it's what we do every day. Typically, we have transformers that will um, be usable in many different locations, so you can um, be very cost conscious of how much material you have to have. In this case, 
these are one-off transformers just for this site. So we would have to uh, purchase three new ones for the manhole and then three new ones to leave in our stockyard in case there's a problem with these transformers. Is the level of, of service then not the same as this gigantic uh, transformer here? Um, at the end of the day, in the ground or above the ground, the customer will see no, no yeah. difference in service. Exactly. How is the fire station, correct? The fire station has their own transformer. It, yeah, there were some subsequent slides that showed the Verizon building. So what I was trying to show with those, if you go down the last two uh, slides. Um, so these are renderings we wanted to show from different angles what that would look like. Um, in particular, I wanted to show that the line of sight in, in the very first slide really wasn't impacted by uh, the transformer being You can see that from 30,000 feet in the air. That's how big it is. <laughs> it's a gigantic. And, for, and, and, and it impacts our town center for 40 years. I'm not going to support it. Sorry. There are ways there to be fine. Be these these boxes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why, that's why I'm here. Yeah, that's why I'm going to these boxes. I'm sorry. You, you, can, or... you can beautify but, it any way you want. That's a giant box in the middle of town. That's, that's why I said certain decisions would have to be made before I shared my news. Can I, can I back up? Sure. Are you telling me that this particular transformer was mandated by decisions that the landowner or the property owner made when they renovated? Yes. Okay, so we've got a global issue here, which is what can we do to make sure that a property owner never puts you or the town in this situation? I agree with that. Because I'm actually kind of pissed. <laughs> Yeah, um, I can give you my word that um, I will always do what's in the best interest of the town of Belmont. Um, that decision was made uh, prior to- prior, no, I, I am not blaming you for this. You are the messenger, I'm not shooting you. Um, I'm just not, not pleased about these, this. These last two slides, uh, this is um, northbound on Leonard Street. The first transformer in the red circle is the fire department. You can't put one next to that? It's just the one that serves? We looked at that actually. There isn't enough have to cross real out. estate there for us to put a transformer. There's not enough there. Why? There's all the because to operate these transformers, you need 10 feet of clear space in front of the transformer. A uh, uh, person who operates that it's the building next to the to the fire station, the Verizon, it's the Verizon, Verizon building. building. Yes, we can't purchase some land from them. The problem is we still have to cross Alexander Street with all its utilities. Look at least land That's from that. Yeah. Um, we could investigate that. We. I, uh, I'd be guessing to give you an answer. We can investigate that. Right. Um, but I wanted to sh just show that, you know, from a line of sight driving up and down Leonard Street, there, although those are set back a little bit further, they're clearly two transformers, same size transformers. Yeah, but they're not in front, they're not on a sidewalk where businesses exist. They're in front of the fire station and another business. This, this is, look at this. I mean, this is in front of CVS. And I mean, from my perspective, I, you know, and at least based on these pictures, I think it impacts um, our town center in, in a very negative way. I understand the need, I get it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sort of challenging that right no, I here, but I, I, I think having that thing there for 40 years, I, I mean, I can, I, sorry. Great. Enough said, Mr. Chair. Does the transformer I, make any noise when it operates? No, they're, they're pretty quiet. Um, during uh, inclement weather, rainy days, sometimes there's a, uh, a very low level hum, uh, but that's typically if it's in a corner around walls and has something to kind of bounce off of. So we wouldn't expect any noise um, to that transformer. What are, what are the screening or beautification options for something like this? Plus you have those poles, right? So kids are gonna be hitting, hitting their heads on those poles and riding their bikes along the sidewalk there. So those balls, we do require traffic protection uh, because it's a well, piece of uh, electrical equipment, liquid filled. Um, we could paint that, and, and I think that was a little bit of um, what Glenn was gonna bring up, but we can allow that to be painted any color or any... Um, <laughs> Can you put plantings around it? We could put plantings around it. Which is that encircled the whole thing? Yep, we could do that. Um, one of the concerns that we had with um, the, the Department of Public Works was the maintenance that um, this would cause, right? So if we put plantings out there, they're going to be maintained. Yep. They tend to catch uh, fire. Well, just you know, trash and what have. <laughs> they shouldn't. 
<laughs> any fires, um, but they can they can you know kind of just catch trash that might be either blowing up or down the the roadway. Um, Do the business owners have any opinion on this? And so we reached out to uh, Kevin Poli from Locatelli Associates via email, asked if he wanted to meet to discuss this. We gave him a high level what our thoughts were, what we were intending to do, and we did not uh, receive it. Is there a way to plan it? He's going to support this. Well, wait, wait a second. So, okay, Glenn, Glenn, what is your... Uh... Well, just let me, let me just provide some quick context here to throw a lifeline to my friend here. I, I remember all of this very clearly because all of this developed during the reconstruction of Belmont Center, which was at the same time when the uh, Locatelli building was being renovated. And there was this issue of the transformer, where to locate it, how to locate it. And Kevin Foley, as the property owner, was adamant that that transformer was not going to what we called behind the building on Claflin Street because that was, in his mind, the front of the building. So he left it to the town in Belmont Light to deal with a way to get that transformer out on, you know, in the back of the building, which was Leonard Street. The solution that we came up with, because at that time, nobody had an appetite to put that thing above ground. The solution that we came up with, I say we, this was, you know, we all kind of had a say in this, but ultimately it was Belmont Light because it was, it was, it's their operations, right? It was to put it underground, but you couldn't put it comfortably underground because the vault runs right through the curb line on Leonard Street. So now we had to figure out a way to doctor that curb line to, to try to hold some kind of a visual line of curbing along that section of road while keeping the vault and, and the uh, contents protected. And we knew that there were gonna be issues with, with water and drainage. We did our best to grade all that area and try to make it work. And as Craig said, a, a transformer that should have given you 25 to 30 years didn't make it five years. That's primarily because of the grading issues and the constraints being underground in that spot. Hey, can I ask one quick question? When a transformer fails, that's on Belmont Light. It's not on the property owner. Correct. Yes, it's us. Because it's your equipment. Yes. Yeah, I'm still I'm still stuck on the fact that the property owners imposed this cost on the public, and I'm really not happy about it. Yeah, you know, because Foodies, the front of Foodies was in the, on the back of on the back. Yeah. Of so so I knew he was leasing the property to Foodies. What I wanted the board to know is that for the last few years I've been working with, is it the Belmont Arts Council? Or, is that? Yeah, the local cultural council. Yeah, I've been, I've been working with them. They contact me every year because they apply for grant money to pay artists to paint what primarily is the transformer boxes, the controller boxes for the traffic signal systems. Um, but I actually communicated with them tonight and confirmed that that type of thing can be painted as well. Um, so if it helps to kind of soften help me, Glenn, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> I just want everyone to be aware that they get the grant money, they can pay an artist to do something, I'm sure, pretty interesting. With appreciate them. you looking into that, but thank you. So I, I assume the team has evaluated every alternative site for this thing, but um, could, could you uh, just recap, uh, is there any, I'm not, of course, I don't know where this thing is fed from. Is there any way this could go in the fire center, in the fire station parking lot, for example? In, in back of the building? Back of the building. <clears throat> um, the issue we have there, if you can go back to that slide too, please. It's just the Alexander Ave corridor. Um, Which quadruples the price. It's, it's yeah, we, we've got a significant, um, yeah, it's that the, one. the lower one, that, that small one behind. It's all a price issue. Well, actually, it's, it's not just it's 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 the physical construction getting up Alexander Ave, finding a path, um, the one above this one. Yeah, you got to keep the yeah, blue green. There you go. Are, yeah, so you can. Oh, because the MW, MWRA mm -hmm. is. Yeah, you have two 20 inch mains MWRA. Uh, we we encountered them up on uh, up on Street, Prospect Street, right? And uh, the original request from them is they wanted us to go six, stay six feet away from them, which put us about 15 feet deep in uh, in the street. So it's just finding a path up Alexander to get onto London Street. That's the uh, the main issue that we we have. And so the other issue that you're you're presenting to us is it's not just that underground is one and a half times more expensive right now it's that we're potentially replacing it every five to ten years instead of every 30 years no. is that well slide three if you can go down one more slide it's not feasible to go further north on Leonard. 
The only problem you have with going further away from the load yes. is voltage problems as well. So we can move the transformer, but as you keep going further away from where the load is, like the CVS that's being fed, yeah. you run into voltage issues and things like that. What does that mean? But, but going further north? They, they won't receive the proper voltage that we're required to uh, provide to them. But, but, but going, this is. going significantly north on Leonard Street or any, anything past Alexander Avenue street. means get getting over the MWRA service. Yes. 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 What do we have to do? Some regrading and some drainage improvements? Yeah, so, so this about? slide here, the, there's our manhole uh, with the, the two openings on it. So one of those openings today has a transformer on top of it. But uh, the block is what we would have to do from a construction standpoint. We have to bump the curb out, as I said. So that takes away those two parking spaces. We have to do that so that we can raise the casting of the manhole, get the manhole cover out of the gutter. So, um, so you're going to have this bump out. The square, the black square box is a, a drain. So we replace the drain and we would tie it into the drain uh, system, which is in green uh, across the street there. Um, what that creates is three parking spaces between the two bump outs, the one at the corner of uh, Alexander Ave, where the crosswalk is, and then the one that we would create. So the DPW, that was going to be a, uh, a maintenance issue uh, with leaves and debris getting caught in that drain where it would need to be maintained uh, a lot more than a drain that would be a, along a uh, longer path of uh, water flow, if you will, because that's just three spots, so it's whatever, it's about 30 feet of, of, uh, of parking there. As a lot of the water comes down uh, Alexander Ave and hits that curb and falls down Leonard Street. So, oh, just just to put a dollar figure on it, um, how much are the oddball transformers? And I gather there's probably a long lead time for them these days. Yes. So those transformers uh, were quoted at thirty-five thousand dollars a piece. Um, we require three and then three spares. The time frame to get those transformers is 72 weeks, so a year and a half. So uh, 72 weeks. 72 weeks. Yes. So um, since COVID, we've had, uh, in at least in the electrical industry, but I think it's everywhere, major uh, supply chain uh, issues, and so uh, these transformers being manufactured specifically for this, not something that's kind of a shelf item or something they run through. Uh, they gave us a 72 weeks. Time. And we have experience the last, over the last year where even we call them what we call bread and butter or our basic transformers that we use everywhere. They've gone up uh, quadruple in time. So it used to be a couple of weeks, takes six months or so for basic transformers. And, and how much is this surface mounted transformer? The transformer is about $50,000 for that one transformer. So I'm sorry, so we'd have to, if it's underground, it's three transformers. If it's above ground, it's one. So underground is three transformers, above ground is one. Okay. It's a, a, a three-phase unit, so it's okay. the way it's built, it's all continuous. And also, you, I thought you said earlier that the underground, even if you raise the vault, you're still not convinced you're solving the flooding problem. Right, we have to, that drainage has to be installed, um, <laughs> curb has to be bumped out to get the manhole cover out of the uh, gutter, basically. Um, I've got, I don't know if you want it or not, but I, the pictures here, if you. Uh, I think we've got them in our. Well, this just shows that that cover a little bit better than that other one. Uh, so, Craig, if I'm following this, um, the, the transformer cost alone we have to vote on this? for the surface mount transformer is about fifty thousand dollars. Yes. For the oddball underground units, you would actually buy six because you'd buy three and you'd want three spares. Although I'm a little nervous about having three spares in storage indefinitely because and that, that's the real issue from a price perspective. Typically, you'd buy those three spares, but they could be used in multiple locations. Right. So it was a, it's it's a value proposition where it's worth purchasing them, so you have them. In this particular case, we don't have any other system in Belmont that would require these transformers, and apparently. The entire Northeast doesn't as well because we. Uh, I'm sorry to get into the weeds here, but the, 
I share Mark's concerns, maybe, maybe not as much, but I certainly <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chair. share them. Um, so if you had three units down there and one failed, what would the impact be on Belmont Center? So we, we have the spare transformer, so we're- Suppose you didn't have any spares, but yet if there were three units underground and only one failed and the other two um, kept working. They would, they would this, the, the, the business uh, that are being served by this transformer, which is basically the old Macy's building, all, all the stores up to the book, um, the bookstore, they would be, they would have what we call part power. They wouldn't have full power. So that's what it basically is. They, could, they couldn't. Talk. Not really. They, they would not have heat. They would not have um, air conditioning or any what was three phase service. So they would have basic lights and basic uh, power like plugs, uh, you know, for for equipment, but they would not have the power they need for any kind of refrigeration things of that nature. Well, then is there any possibility of when you said raise the manhole? Could it be raised so it would be like a, a low structure coming out of the sidewalk, but limited in size and and have the three units underground, but elevated enough so that the flooding problem would be, you could have a proper pitch to to uh, drain it off if water did get in there? The, the biggest issue you have is um, we can raise the manhole, get it out of the gutter. That's something we can do. The, the problem is because that manhole fell on the curb line and the opening to that manhole is in the curb line, we have no choice but to bump the curb around the manhole entrance. And you lose how many spaces when you do that? You'll lose two parking spaces. And have to add a drainage structure to catch the runoff on the upstream side, the Alexander Ave side of the bump up. A stru drainage structure means what exactly? Catch basin. Okay. And tie that, in, tie that into the drain in Leonard Street. Okay, but there's an underground solution that at least would work better, um, but obviously costs more. So, so Rod, to be clear, you're just talking about something that still comes up like a bench height, or are you talking level on the ground? I, I lost what, what your structure would look like. It would be in the ground. It would be... Um, the transformers uh, would be underground, but the manhole would be raised. How high it would be? The manhole it would be flush with the with the sidewalk. We wouldn't we would not have a structure uh, protrude up. That would be a seven foot by fourteen foot bump, if you will. So on the coming picture, out of the Craig just recently yeah, circulated. You're looking at that that structure, probably up six inches. Right now it's sitting flush with the street. The curb reveal is roughly six inches that you'd want to be at. Yeah. So you'd end up being about six inches higher than it is right now. But so you could get three underground transformers in there just by having six inches visible on the surface? They're in there today. Excuse me. Well, they were in there prior to the failure. Right. Um, the problem is it's, it's a very full manhole. So as I described, we can have personnel in there. We have the ability to de-energize that manhole. So if we had a problem, if something was going on where we needed to enter that manhole, we would de-energize the manhole. The stripper stores would be without power while we did what we needed to do to, to either make a repair or investigate what was going on. All right, so, and I, I I know we shouldn't be doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So you're you're saying, as I understand it, the raising the um, um, if you kept it all underground, you want to gain about six inches so you'd have proper drainage to this uh, drainage uh, catch basin on the other side of the street. And you need about six inches to do that? We would raise it to prevent water flow from coming into the manhole. Okay. So if you look at that second picture I just handed out, the frame of that manhole is all graded. When you have equipment in the ground, you need ventilation. Otherwise, that's when you see in the news, manhole covers uh, blowing in the air. Yeah. Because it's vented like that and it's in the gutter, it's a natural catch basin. Right. That's the problem. So we would raise that, raise the sidewalk, bump the curb, raise it up six inches so it's 
the sidewalk is flat and flush and even. This would be out of the water path, if you will. Now, the, because we bumped the curb um, per DPW, we would need to install a catch basin and tie that into the drainage system. Okay, so then the whole package would be uh, raising this grate basically about six inches, uh, which would hopefully keep water from entering below in the first place, but there'd be some drainage system underground in case water did come in because... So typically water doesn't harm our equipment. Water is usually not the issue. Um, it's the salt. So in this particular case, uh, because of where it's located and it's the only drain in that vicinity, all the salt runoff from both the sidewalk, the street, all went in that and just ate away at the aluminum okay. uh, structure. But it, but it sounds, let me sort of just get to a conclusion that it sounds like if the grate was basically raised by six inches, give or take, uh, you could install three new oddball transformers, although at clearly higher cost, uh, they should work, and if for some reason, because they wouldn't be subject to the same water and salt exposure that they have now, if for some reason routine maintenance was necessary in those units, in the worst case, you'd have to de-energize. Correct. The, and you'd, you'd have to take all three down? Yes, yeah, it's a it's like system. A system. Yeah. Yeah. But, right. but, but that, that should be a pretty rare event, no? Correct. Yeah, should be. So once in a while, the businesses may be inconvenienced and they could have advance notice unless, you know, if it was a routine maintenance item. I think the only, the biggest drawback to that scenario isn't for us, the electric company, it's to the parking out there because you're losing. Right. That's so right. When all is yeah, said and done, I'm I'm just, when all is said and done, yeah. we're losing two one, spaces total? Instead of one. We, instead of one. We're, we're losing, losing one more spot. I, I think the parking's irrelevant. That's not the Agreed. issue. Agreed. This is a 40 year decision. I understood. I understood. I'll be gone by then. Right? No, you, no you're going to be serving the 10th term. Yeah, I'll be serving my 15th term. term. Right. This, I, I'm sorry, Greg. I appreciate all the hard work you've done this. I can never support this above ground transformer. But I, I think if we're doing all this basically to save one incremental parking space, um, that's a trade off that. Yeah, yeah for, for me, the concern was not the parking space. For me, the concern was reliability of the transformer and the equipment um, because small businesses are not going to like losing power. So, you know, I agree the aesthetics of this are awful. And if it were only an aesthetic decision, then I think it's worth the money because Belmont Center is what we want to turn into one of many crown jewels of Belmont's uh, small business um, landscape. But I, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to be comfortable that functionally yeah. it, it can work. It sounds like it will the same, right? Yes, we, we, we can make that work, absolutely. So, Craig, when you... But I wanted, I just wanted to get a, one, one comment was, it, this wasn't all about cost. We actually saw four pros for this, right? First, first was for the businesses themselves, where they had the ability in the future to uh, increase power needs, if, if so be it, uh, very easily. They, they went in that. The second was... The, uh, the town center losing the one spot, as we described, there was a win there. Um, certainly there was a win for Belmont Light because the cost was cheaper than going back underground. Um, when there was a fourth that I just lost. But if you, yeah, these, this is a better maintenance scenario for you guys. As oh, well. that was the fourth. It was the maintenance for the town. That, again, talking with the DPW, they felt that that catch basin because of uh, its location in, in that spot, would be a maintenance, um, you know, issue going forward. That I mean, your do. maintenance for your staff to be able to maintain an above ground versus in the Oh, absolutely. Stood for a while, and as long as it's, I mean, I guess the concern I have it is it safe to go <laughs> below ground and, main, and service those? You have to de-energize. You have to de-energize. Yes. So, Craig, the, since these oddball transformers, I, I guess, are custom built for Belmont Light, are, could they be oversized so they could uh, accommodate a future demand? No. So the, what's there now is as, as large as we can yeah, physically enough. fit in there. And, and what's the utilization? Are they at 100% or are they? They were, they were sized when Foodies was built. Uh, we've seen the load come down since CDS has gone in there. Um, so we could um, put smaller ones in there at this point. 
but again, that um, we wouldn't have the the capacity that the owner had requested originally. Yeah, it so makes sense to max to max out if you're going to have yeah. you know, something down there. I'm sure the draw draw by foodies was significant. Yes, it was. Yes. Well, um, we certainly understood that the request was a well, Mr. Chair. I mean, my, I think I made my, my what my vote would be if we decided to move forward with this. What what is the role of the select board? Is this a vote um, by the it sounds like you said no to the above round. So <laughs> at least one. No, I'm just not, who, who control? But who controls? Oh, this is you. Yeah, we have. Yeah, it's our, it's our street. Yeah, it's our street. Yeah. Purely select board. Okay. I understand for a while the impact that it has on Belmont Life from a cost perspective, but this is a 40-year decision. I amortize the cost of four years. Um, detrimental effect in my mind. Beautification, the beauty, uh, beautification of Belmont Center is significant, and I'll be at. The additional cost, as long as it's it can be maintained safely, with, and it sounds like capacity, at least for the short term over the next few years, but could be the same to some extent. Um, I support you know investigating. Maybe we need to get a rendering of what the above ground would look because this is not really a rendering of what the below ground look, would look like, right? Because we want to see. So Glenn, how many parking spaces have we lost so far with having these Jersey barriers there? Two. Oh, well, we talk about the Jersey barriers because for the because of temporary eggs work or the restaurant setup. No, for the for, for, the transport for what we have now. Two, two, yes. two, so the parking lot in back is never full. It's never full. Mm, I just I just admire how many like cans of worms you want to open tonight, Mr. Palillo. <laughs> you think it's full? I mean, I no, I don't, but uh, we, we also don't yeah, I mean, have a reason. We can talk about whether that should be free parking or not at the time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize, but I cannot I, I, support I, this above ground. I would like, getting awfully late, I'd like a little, like to think about it some more between now and our next meeting, but I take it that the temporary unit that's there now is working and can stay. Uh, yes, we don't have a choice. We have uh, 72 weeks before we will see mm -hmm. the transformer. So that will be there through the winter, through next summer, hopefully not much longer. Oh, anyway. Okay. Can, can we get, is it possible, I mean, this is kind of just roughed out here. This is not what it's going to look like, right? I mean, what, what a rendering of a below ground would look like with the curbing, you know, elevated, because this is not what that is, is it? Is this what that yep. would look like with that little patch of... No, well, no, that's the no, that, that's system. yes, that's existing. So we would have to would be possible get a rendering uh, of what the below ground, you know, what would that look, site look like with below ground transformers with the elevated sidewalk? Is that no? Yeah, it's just the curb line. We're just oh, raising that curb line. Is missing out of my head. Is it possible yeah. to get a rendering? Yeah, we should be able to do that. Yeah. So I, I do want to say I, I I hear the concerns about maintenance, and I know that town staff bears a really heavy burden. Right now. Hope. I'm expressing appreciation and apologies. Um, I, I think we are moving toward an aesthetic um, solution, but do you want you to know that we did hear what you were saying, and I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant and I'm appreciative of all that town staff does with our uh, our quirks and foibles and desires. Patrice, when's our next first meeting in Agreed. October? Agree with you, Elizabeth. Your next meeting is your full next full meeting is October 23rd. Oh, a couple. Oh. Well. Um, I wish it were sooner, but uh, how about if we commit to having a final resolution of this question by the 23rd? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I realize we lose a month in terms of the order of these transformers, but well, a little less than a month. Okay. All right. Thank you, Craig. This is um, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that, Glenn. Thank you. Welcome. Are you here for the payment? I am. I, I, I'm, are we yeah, on my next? Yeah, you're next. Should I just slide over here? Thanks. We could show us the artwork on that thing as well. <laughs> oh, there are some beautifully painted boxes all over the state. Oh, all over town. And, and town. There's how many gallons? How many, I mean, you, you need dozens of gallons of paint to paint that thing. thing. It's so big. <laughs> well, <laughs> dozens of gallons. I think that's probably true. Yes, and probably some good size oh, brushes. Well, it's yeah. Good. <laughs> I'll pay for it privately, though. It would take you a week to just paint it so big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, 
<laughs> Sorry, Glenn. Sorry. Glenn, you're going to be speaking about the paper management contract. Yes. Are we ready? Should we? Yeah. The presentation. I just want to um, uh, remind Sheila Flewelling that uh, we're going to recognize her for a question after you make your remarks. Glenn. Okay. Yeah. Go. Mr. Chair, Glenn Clancy, Town Engineer, I'm uh, presenting the uh, results of the paper management contract that we put out to bid on September 8th. Uh, we had four uh, companies respond to our bid. Uh, the last time we did a paper management contract, we had two. So it's nice that we're getting some additional interest. Unfortunately, one of the bids, um, they only put a number in for the pavement piece and not the sewer piece, and they had to be disqualified. Uh, but we did end up with three. Um, three good bids. Newport Construction came in as the low bidder. If you want, I can show you the. I can I can verbalize the breakout. So the total bid from Newport Construction was two million five hundred eighty-seven thousand two hundred and three dollars and fifty-seven cents. That bid breaks out at two million two hundred ninety-four thousand two hundred seventy-seven and thirty-five cents for the road work, and then two hundred ninety-two thousand nine hundred and twenty-six. Uh, in 22 cents for the sewer work. Uh, Newport has done a, a lot of work in Belmont. They have the current contract, which I suspect is why Ms. Llewellyn wants to speak this evening. Um, that, not to say, they've, they've done a tremendous amount of work in town. Um, Newport has? They do a lot of work in, in the area. Construction has done a lot of work. Yeah, Newport Construction was the contractor that did the Trapello Road, Belmont Street project for a mass dot. And Glenn, it looks like the bid came in substantially less than you were projecting. It did. Yay. It did, yeah. The um, and can I also ask? Um, you know that we're using fiscal year twenty three chapter ninety money. Are we able just to bank that? Is that why it rolls over? Okay. Yeah. So this this particular bid. Now, typically, our pavement management contracts are identified as an FY, a fiscal year project. Um, so had we had the ability to be more timely with this, this would actually be the FY twenty three pavement management project. At this time last year is when the Office of Community Development probably hit its low point in terms of staffing and vacancy and everything. I didn't have an opportunity to put a list together for our consultants until January. Uh, and that put us right behind the eight ball all the way through the, the uh, winter into the spring. So um, so the good news is we have, we have a contractor on board. Um, I'm hoping that some of this work, if, the sewer work probably, um, I, I would love to knock out Bright Road this fall, it's a, it's a mill and overlay, it's only half the road. A few years ago, Belmont Light did, uh, did their work um, on one side of the street, they resurfaced that. The other side is 20 years old, plus or minus, it needs to be repaired. I would love to do that before the winter sets in. Um, and then we still have all of our FY24 money that uh, I'm working right now to put a list together to get ahead of that and uh, hopefully be in a position to have you guys be signing an FY24 project sometime in March, April, uh, as opposed to uh, September. Okay. So Glenn, my only uh, question about Newport construction goes back to Trapello Road when there was kind of a debacle with the sidewalks on Trapello Road. But yeah. uh, is that, was that ever, was it ever established who was responsible for that or? Can we be sure that it won't recur? I don't believe it was. I, I, well, I shouldn't say that. It was resolved, obviously, to the point where Newport had to replace a bunch of concrete. Remind room. me, Mr. Chair, what that was. I'm sorry. There was a, a, a very large percentage of the new sidewalks on Chapella Road cracked or flaked. But, but sort of it, was the, it was the first year. Yeah. Because that, that project was essentially a two-year project. Maybe it went into a third year. but. Um, the concrete work was basically split up between a year one and a year two, and the year one concrete work did not hold up at all. Um, what I don't know, Mr. Chair, is whether or not it was determined that that was a workmanship issue with Newport or whether it was a supplier issue with whoever they were using that was providing the concrete. Um, that may have been an investigation that they resolved, and I wasn't made aware of the results. I, I only know, as I said, is that Newport was required to replace a bunch of the sidewalk on that job. But since that time, we now have uh, sufficient in-house staff to supervise this work when it's being done? Um, no. In fact, at this moment, we do not. Uh, we so, um, you know, we, we had for many years a full-time resident engineer that was out in the field for, for our sewer projects, for our roadway projects. Uh, this person was solely dedicated to this work, working with the contractors, communicating with residents and 
you know, town staff, if, uh, if a particular operation needed, needed access to a hydrant, for example, they would work with Belmont Water to get a meter on that hydrant. They would do all the logistical work, um, as well as overseeing the actual work of the contractor. Um, the override uh, did not pass in 21, and that position was eliminated. So what we did is we, we, we took as much of, of that that we could put on Ara's plate um, so that he could handle sort of the larger pieces of that responsibility, but, but it's not his primary job. And so um, he does the best he can, but he doesn't have the, the bandwidth or the, the capacity to do that full time. We need a full time resident engineer. We're working to figure that out as part of the uh, reconfiguration of community development into um, what ultimately will result in a, an engineering division in public works. Um, one of the things that we've committed to is reestablishing a full-time resident engineer because it is so necessary. Yeah, yeah this is an we example agree. of being penny-wise and pound foolish, we agree, where we're not investing in long-term quality. <clears throat> we're we're going to lose money in the long run without that position. Okay, are there any other questions for well, Glenn about the contract? Just a broader, no, yeah. not, not on the contract, Mr. Chair, but a broader question, Glenn, if you might. Um, in some time, it seems to me that we've gotten a more sort of overview of our payment management plan. Hmm. Um, I wonder at some point that we could, I know it's a busy time of year with budget season and all that, but I think it's helpful and informative to the community in terms of where, I mean, there's so many roads that need to get done, right? And we've done great work to date in well, I, I appreciate the compliment. Um, the fact is we do what we can with the budget that we have to work. Yeah. Um, this is not a good time in the, in, in the immediacy of this moment to have that presentation because um, I have asked our consultant to do a town-wide uh, survey, okay. the condition of the roads. They're about halfway done. Good idea. Uh, in the, and also a part of that is moving to a GIS-based pavement management application. Um, I've had an opportunity to look at these things over the years, and I know that there are departments out there in the world that use these things and swear by them. I was a manual guy. Um, I, I had to balance National Grid's calendar and their desire to do work our own Belmont Water Department and their capital improvement plan and how that meshed with work that I needed to get done. There were so many moving parts to this that um, it was a lot easier for me to lock myself in my office for a couple of days in January and, uh, and, and, and refresh my 30 year budgeting, I mean, which is what I used to do. I don't know what the new, I was trained on it actually last week and I uh, have access to it now and I'm gonna start playing around with it soon. Um, I don't know if it'll give me the flexibility I need, I'm hoping. One of the goals here is that um, I was concerned that, again, talking about succession planning, um, when that day does come that I decide that, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to move on to greener pastures, I want to be able to hand something off to someone that is, that is you know, usable and makes sense. Um, my manual approach to pavement management is probably not the thing to be handing off to someone. And so a more traditional pavement man management application is the way to go. Um, so I'm committed to making that work so that if for no other reason, I can hand it off to someone in the future and have them be able to jump right in and take it. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? No. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Sheila Flewelling because she had a question uh, earlier. Roy, thank you. My question is, is this Newport construction the same folks that just did the sidewalks and curbing on Sycamore Street? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, they are. Okay, so we had quite a debacle with our sidewalks and curbing, Roy, um, as a met with this particular um, outfit. And as a matter of fact, they installed asphalt, they dug it up, redid it, damaged a tree, had to um, reach out to Mr. Santoro and Mr. Marcotte. They both came out, they assessed it, and actually could not believe the job that was done. So our overall experience in our neighborhood was a sheer lack of communication, terrible communication, um, as well as zero oversight. Each time we approached the contractor, asked for a foreman, or you know, raised a concern, they would tell us to call the city. I myself have called twice, left a message last week, no return call, left a message today, no return call. As a resident, the entire experience was extremely frustrating. 
you have a question? Wow. Well, so, I, I guess powerful statement. I, I think the, the the implicit question is uh, what uh, mechanism is in place to make sure that Newport does a better job? Or are they doing sidewalks as part of this work plan? Uh, they'll do some sidewalk, yes. Okay. Does it call into question us moving forward with that? I don't think this is on Newport at all. I think this goes back to what I said earlier. We don't have the staff to stay on top of this stuff. Look, I'm going to tell you this. We fix streets. If you have a resident, if you have a roadway with 20 residents on that street, 17 of them go about their business, they don't have an issue with anything. Three or four of them, they, they want to be so far into the weeds on this stuff, and the expectations they place on the contractor is unrealistic. The contractor is not going to be out there taking direction from individual residents. That's why they refer them to the town. In our challenges, there's no one in the town to take those calls because they're off doing other things. But, which, again, it speaks to why we need a full-time resident. Well, Glenn, I, I, I agree with that part, but yeah. um, do we know that whatever work Newport did say around Butler School met, met the spec that was in the contract. Absolutely. Now, am I going to sit here and tell you that there weren't some problems along the way? I, I know there were problems along the way because there were days they had crews out there working that Ara couldn't get out there and they did things that they weren't supposed to do or they sent a different crew out there than from the crew that Ara had met with and because Ara wasn't able to be there on site when the, when the new crew came. They did things that they weren't supposed to do. They corrected all of that. We had a situation where they put curbing in and a, and a newly planted tree ended up two feet out in the street. That tree was supposed to have been moved a couple of weeks ago. It wasn't moved. We weren't going to tell the contractor to go away and not come back until we resolved that. They were in town. They were working. We knew that they could continue to do their work and that we would eventually move the tree, put the curbing in that we want to do. This is construction. This is not pretty and it's not easy. And the fact that we get contractors to come in and do work is, is a blessing sometimes in and of itself, because there are other communities that they could be working in. The fact that they show up sometimes unannounced, while that can be a little bit of an issue for residents who weren't anticipating that, and even for staff that wasn't expecting that, I'm going to tell you that every time, the fact that they're here and willing to work at the end of the day is a benefit for us. Yeah, but then we're paying them $2.5 million. So I'm not and Mark, surprised. there are other communities paying them just as much or more. So my, my question is, from your perspective, the quality control issues were a town failing, not a contractor failing. Oh, well, I think the issue... And I'm not saying that you failed. I understand. A structural... I understand. A, a I, would, I would tell you that, like, the, the tree issue, I mean, that was a communication issue between engineering and highway. That wasn't on Newport. So what's the solution, Glenn, to have someone on site when they're doing their work all the time, if possible? Well, the, solution, staff. the solution is we need to get a full-time person back overseeing this work the way we used to have it. We've been flying by the seat of our pants for three years. Can we add someone now? We're working on it. Can we add someone now? I mean, I would support that. I mean, I think she'll- well, I think, I think uh, we've got a plan to, to do that. concerns about this. And um, I'm, I'm sure, as you state, there were, there was, you, were, you, you admitted that there were, there were incidents that occurred hmm. um, because we just don't have the staff to provide the the necessary oversight. Oh, and that goes to the company. I mean, you know, they're not doing us a favor. We're paying them $2.5 million, but there, I'm sure there are issues along the way where they're doing this work um, and without um, some oversight by the town because we're short sure staff, they're just proceeding along and there are issues that come up that need to be addressed. The, the, the communication issue that Sheila raised, who do you think does that communicating? It's town staff. Yeah, it's town if there's no one on town staff to do so, it, how do you do it? Before we execute on this contract, could we have a town engineer in place? No. 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 We would have well, to advertise actually, and go interview. It, 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 well, it and given the fact that we've got about a month, maybe six weeks left in the construction season. Right, we're going to lose. Yeah, we don't want to. My, my opinion here. But they're not going to do all of the $2.5 million work in that period of time. That's correct. But they can start. The time they'll, they'll, they they'll cycle through to the spring, right? Oh, absolutely. And we hope to have somebody on better. Okay. I think with that understanding, I'm willing to move forward with Newport, but we're committed to having... You know, yeah, and, and I would say, listening to this, the issue is not Newport. The, I think any contractor coming in would have um, similar... So, so um, it, I mean, I think, if, I'm, if I may, because I know how the budget season is going to proceed, um, and uh, there's going to be um, a lot of push and pull um, in terms of needs. This is a real need. We've talked about this a long time, and I think we have to commit ourselves 
to ensuring that we hire a No, agent. we've identified this as a critical act. And we can't sort of roll back on that because it's impacting um, our service to our residents. Right. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, the schools and other sort of departments are going to have significant needs. And we can't just say, well, we'll give it to the town engineer. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to agree to that. I think we need a town engineer. So if we could commit to that, so that when Newport is executing on this on this point, we have someone providing the office site that would need it. It does indeed, and I completely support the uh, filling okay, that. Thank you, Sheila, for your feedback. I'm sorry that you experienced it. The board is committed to ensuring that the execution of this contract is done in a much better way. Okay. Um, so we're, that, we're, we're going to move on and... Uh, so we, we need to approve. The we contract. should approve the contract with the understanding that uh, we will do everything Glenn, thank you for possible that. to to make it work. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I move to approve the payment management contract for new construction in the amount of two million five hundred eighty-seven thousand two hundred three dollars and fifty-seven cents. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, I don't know how you do it. I'll be able to fifty-seven cents in it, but I guess that's what you do, right? <laughs> Right, the uh, next sure item. Pay them that 57 cents. <clears throat> next item on the agenda is a supplemental appropriation for phase one of the community path. Please. Mr. Chair, uh, Glenn Clancy, Town Engineer. Um, you will all recall a special session that the government held um, a few weeks ago to discuss the uh, request by Niche Engineering for additional funds to complete the design for phase one of the community path. At that meeting, we talked um, about a couple of things. One was um, the desire to keep it working through this 25% design phase because we are trying to be in a position to have a 25% design public hearing in November. 25% design public hearing is a major milestone for MassDOT in their review and approval of our project. Um, as mentioned at that meeting, I'll mention briefly that um, when the 25% design was submitted to MassDOT, um, along with uh, several comments that they had about things that we were thinking about doing and, and the way that we were designing, the MBTA decided at that point that um, after a couple of years of us going down the design road of anticipating a tunnel jacking operation to put in the Alexander Avenue underpass, the MBTA decided, in fact, that they would rather have a cut and cover operation. Um, that basically sent Niche back to the drawing board on how we were going to construct the Alexander Ave underpass. That is one of the reasons why this request is being made as well. Um, what I asked Niche to do was break out, break out the initial request for an amendment into two, two, sec two sections. One would be to get us to, through the 25% design phase. The second one would be the additional money they needed for the, the back end of the design. What you have before you this evening is the money needed to do to, uh, for the 25% design phase. Um, the, the value of that is $170,725. There is um, remaining from an original uh, community preservation appropriation, um, $140,000. Uh, 140,000, we don't have that number. It's um, $141,057. That money is remaining from an original community preservation um, appropriation. We've had to come up with an additional $29,668 in order to cover the cost for this amendment. Um, on a separate track for the remaining amount of work that's required for the remainder of the design of the project, we have filed a um, an off cycle funding request. We have filed an off cycle application for community preservation funds. That, will that one of the ones you referred to last meeting we had? Yeah, so it's received preliminary approval. Um, it, I anticipate it will receive final approval in October and then it will then be forwarded to special town meeting in November. Right. So the, uh, the last piece to mm -hmm. kind of close the loop on the outcome of the August meeting was um, there was discussion about. You know, mm -hmm the number of uh, sub consultants that are being hired by niche in order to get this work done there's some there's some very uh, task specific things that apparently these consultants are uh, are able to do better than anyone else so um, niche hires them to do that kind of work scheduling and things like that for example on the actual cut and cover operation that will happen um, 
the understanding now is it'll happen on a, a Thanksgiving weekend, a four-day weekend. So there'll be a lot of uh, there'll be a lot of coordination necessary, and there are consultants that handle that kind of work. Uh, there was discussion about how much of a markup niche uh, gains on those types of arrangements. So I think we speculated at that meeting that was approximately twenty-five percent. Uh, in fact, it's ten percent. Um, I went back to niche. I explained the situation, and I said that that you know we believe that it would be a nice gesture for niche to meet us halfway on their markup. Uh, they did that, and uh, and as a result, the the overall value of the uh, amendments is slightly less than that, sixteen thousand less than what it was initially when we were talking about this back in August. Okay, what's the source for the twenty nine thousand dollars that we're um, so I'm using pavement management funds right now because that was the money that I had most available to me. Uh, and the hope is that if the community preservation money passes, we'll just backfill the pavement management. Oh, okay, so pavement, as long as pavement management is made whole. Right. Yeah. Okay. We need to also approve this amendment letter that they sent us. Yes. I have it. Okay. Yeah, this one. This, so, this so. is the one that's all signed by everyone. Says other than the design. Design. Right. right, but then there is the letter that they sent that includes the full cost of four hundred seventy-six thousand nine twenty-five, presumably, right? No, no, it's it, it's two different amendments. What Glenn just read was. Yeah. So we're signing the first amendment for the smaller amount, and then we'll later sign. The well, there's a letter in our packet for what's the letter? Does it address all these additional services, or just the 170? Mark, what's the date on that? The one you're September 13th. Yeah. So the September 13th, you should have the one that on page five has the breakout of the 170. Now I have that, I mean, but we also have this six page letter that um, it just relates to the 170. So it does relate to the 170. That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's the one we're agreeing to tonight. That's correct. But the additional scope of work of 306,200, is that for later? After town meeting, if that if that gets through town meeting, okay, I'll be back. I'll be back with the station. All right. Yep. Okay. Are you fine with this, Mr. Okay. Approve the niche engineering amendment for design services in the amount of one hundred seventy thousand seven hundred twenty-five dollars. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. All right. Appreciate you talking to Mitch about getting some minor confession. Oh, we've got you're not leaving. We, no, we won't, we won't work <laughs> Wow, we're we're just we're just settling in for the night here. <laughs> Fire Lynch. Fire Lynch. Fire Lynch. Fire Lynch. So Glenn, carry on. Mr. Chair, Glenn Clancy, town engineer. Uh, this last item I have before you this evening um, was an issue that was uh, brought up by Ellen Cushman in her capacity as a member of the land management committee, uh, a committee that the town um, staffs with members of McLean Hospital. Uh, this is concerning um, an access point off of Pleasant Street. If you're not familiar with it, I can assure you you've driven by it many, many times. Uh, off of Pleasant Street, roughly behind the rear entrance to Star Market, there is what they, what's known locally as the old coal road. Um, it was an access road up to the McLean Hospital campus. Is that the one that has the little brick building right there? Um, no, 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 it's okay. before that. Um, okay. Further down. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, Pleasant Street Gate Lodge is what you're referring to. Yep. Um, and so this, this old coal road has been an access point for the Belmont Fire Department for many, many years. Um, if they need to get on the campus for you know, brush fire, for example, this is a way for them to get their equipment up, you know, up behind the back of the campus. Um, when the open space, thank you, when the open space was uh, created, um, you know, you know, early 2000s as a result of McLean's Hospital's rezoning and the town picking up a lot of open space, the cemetery, for example, um, uh, there was there was uh, this public private open space that was created. There was a land management committee that was staffed by town and McLean personnel to basically manage the open space. The old coal road is identified as a road that is for hiking and for trail biking, uh, uh, but it's also there and always uh, intended to be used for the fire department in emergency situations. What's been happening lately is um, people are pulling off of Pleasant Street in their parking 
in the area in front of the gate that accesses the cold. Right, because there's space for two or three cars there. Right, and, uh, and that's a no-no. Uh, okay. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get approval. And the, and the reason the board needs to approve this is because we want it to be enforceable. And for, if, if you guys approve it, then it becomes enforceable and the Belmont Police Department can take action on the signage. We want to post it as a fire lane. It's um, like a no-brainer to me. But Glenn, can right. I ask you, what, um, why would the fire department use the coal road, which is not the easiest road to handle as a using you know, Olmstead Drive now that Olmstead Drive is open? My understanding is that depending on the particular incident that they may be responding to, the coal road may be the best, most direct way for them to get there. Uh, what is, uh, if someone parks there, I assume they get towed, tagged and towed? Um, I, What's the enforcement? I, I, the enforcement is clearly, uh, yeah, a, a ticket, absolutely. I would imagine that if there was an incident and the fire department had to have access, I think they could tow if they wanted to. So our tickets are now $25, raised them from the paltry sum of 15. Well, I mean, I think it does change behavior if you get a $25 ticket, right? Um, yeah, this is not the discussion to have tonight, but I would love to uh, increase, what is it, the local option to increase our, our ticketing limits? Yeah, to to yep. So if, if, on, on sure, a, sure on a place if I may just point out one other thing for people who may be uh, watching at home and have an interest. Um, at 248 Mill Street, there is a parking lot that was built as a trailhead or an access point for the open space. So we're also going to be adding signs underneath the fire lane sign to, uh, and this is what it, they will say, it will say Lone Tree Hill, Belmont Conservation Land, parking located at 248 Mill Street. Yeah. So if anyone pulls off and has a desire to park, you see that, this will tell them where to go, where they can do it in a legitimate parking lot. Um, all good. Thank you, Glenn. I move to approve a fire lane signage along McLean, Cole Road, and Pleasant Street. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Thank you, appreciate it Aye. for the rest of your evening. Evening has just Paul, begun. Paul has been waiting so for, patiently. Paul has been waiting so patiently. All right, next item is an update on the structural well, change implement, implementation committee. Give you Paul. So I'm, I'm Paul Richter. I'm the chair of the structural change implementation committee. I'm Vicki Amalvitano. I'm the co chair. Right. Both of you. Vicky, nice Good to, to meet you, you finally. I think we've only met virtually. All I think we have only met virtually. <laughs> yes, I believe so. All right. Oh. Yeah. So we uh, we gave you a written so it's preliminary report. It's really a status update. Um, we started meeting in February of 2023. I think we had our full we meeting with four members. We we're supposed to have five. We got our fifth member appointed, I think, in June or July. As an energy committee member, right, Paul? Energy committee member. Yeah, so, that person's been attending. John, John Coulterman, yeah. Mm -hmm. He started to come, actually, once he knew he was going to be the designee. Oh, that's great. So, yeah. so we, we, we've been moving along. Um, just for the public to know, the Structural Change Impact Group produced a report, mm -hmm. probably the longest report ever produced in Belmont from a committee, I think. Mm -hmm. Something like 500 pages. Phenomenal work. Yeah. yeah. Analyzed for over 400 ideas, and the report has detailed summaries of 135 ideas. Um, we've been meeting our group, the Structural Change Implementation Committee, has been meeting to try to narrow those down. 135 ideas is a lot of ideas to try to implement. So, so what we're, we're producing in our report is 12 ideas that we think are the, our analysis was biggest financial impact and the most likely to have uh, bear fruit. So we gave in our report the, the 12 ideas that we were putting forward um, and we're here to ask so, um, in our discussions, we understand there is limited bandwidth on staff. All of these ideas are big ideas and take a lot of work to implement. So, and multi-year. And most, multi -year. Of them, most of them need more than one um, budget cycle uh, to complete. So I think the good news is, Paul, as I went down this list, we're actually making progress on a number of these fronts. So yep. yep. I'm very committed to Belmont no longer being the place where good ideas go to die. <laughs> and so I appreciate you keeping this on our radar, but but I think there's an awful lot of agreement. Um, and um, I'm, I'm feeling optimistic about the progress that we're making on, an, on a number of these. And I'm just going to throw out um, 
idea number 36, review town owned used property for best use. Patrice and I are bouncing around an idea that could potentially uh, result in some kind of private public partnership where we could retain some town owned affordable housing for town employees. Huh. Um, it just, just I, I think there's, there's a lot of um, dynamism. I don't know if you want me to go through in any detail on no. any of these, but. The big thing on that idea 36 is the, is the building across the street from us, the, the, uh, the old Belmont Light building. So the, there's a problem. It's be commissioned, I think. Yeah, but oh, it is. I, I spoke it's with a great people, opportunity. It is. I it's spoke with Steve Leonsky about somewhere. this in March, and I just said, what? So a couple things that people should be aware of. The municipal light building, unfortunately, is so deteriorated that it is no longer. The, the Historic District Commission has delisted it as a building of interest just because it's, it would take too much to, to repair it, and, and it's too far away from, from anything happening. And I know that with my community preservation hat because for a long time we listed it as a property of interest, but we, we respond to the historic district commission. But that's also an opportunity. It, it does mean a complete rebuild at some point and hopefully in such a way that is sensitive to the historic uh, nature of the surroundings. So I, I think that uh, working with the planning board, we could come up with something that was, was quite lovely. But um, the problem we have with that building um, is, as Steve Kleonski explained it to me, it's got the third of the three substations that will be decommissioned. And if we decommission them in anything but the current order, it will shut down power to half of Belmont and cost gazillions of dollars that we don't have. So uh, that is something to keep on our radar, but it, it's very uh, long in the future. I, I think potentially a more interesting prospect is the Claflin Street parking lot. Um, something, you know, about podium parking with something above it. Just, um, so, so Paul, can, Paul and Vicki, can you just go, go through line by line here, just your thoughts? Sure. Sure, so the, the 12 ideas that we um, are putting forward as being the most promising ones are 23, increasing revenues from grants, 33, civil service, which you are working on, mm -hmm. 36 that we just talked about, review town on used property for best use, 39, established budget guidelines, that's another idea that is bearing fruit at the moment. Uh, 101 payment in lieu of taxes for nonprofits in private schools. 107 reevaluate town zoning with master plan. Idea 268 pension liabilities retirement board savings. 269 transfer health insurance transfer health care insurance to the GIC. 275 real estate transfer fees. Just stop there for a moment. Explain a little bit more about that one. So I think that's a there's a it's a state program that we could potentially participate in, which would allow us to have a fee on real estate transfer. That's that's about the limit of what I know about that. Is either just enacted or is about to enact. What level of fee? Would I, think, I, think, I, think, I think Boston is also looking mm -hmm. at it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll have to read, go back and read my. The I, I'd have to go look at that idea yeah. in specific. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Idea 378, supplemental tax assessment on new construction. Uh, idea 391. Sorry, just to be clear, that the, it's it's not really a supplemental tax assessment. It's it's, it's really taxing in more current, more right. current, it's, not it's, waiting. It's 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 jumping ahead. It's not, you know putting new growth construction in pro construct, construction right. in it's, progress. It's reflecting the value of. of the project before it's going to wait until it's completed. Can I just interject quickly on that also? I think that would provide a double benefit, not just revenue, but we have projects that limp along for years unfinished to the huge detriment of the neighbors. Yeah. And this might provide an incentive for the finish. developers to finish the project. So you assess at certain points of time of construction and say this is now the value of this construction in progress. If I could, I, I'm fairly familiar with this, and I think that that program is actually, not, it doesn't happen, it doesn't come into effect until you have a certificate of occupancy. And so that's the oh, issue. Yes. And so we already do assess based on the in, enhanced value of the, where the construction is at, as, as of January 1st. So then we need to find some other way to get but, relief but, for neighbors. But I, as I understood the description, you, you maybe save a year because presumably it's occupied fairly right. soon after this is that's correct it wouldn't come in as new it wouldn't it would come in as new growth ordinarily so this would be yes it's just it, a bit. it would allow for a part a partial yeah. year bill you, um, accelerate, and, you just accelerate it for a little bit right and it also kind of relies on us having as the ample staff and the um 
built for, to go out and issue a yep. certificate of occupancy on a timely basis. Okay. So, no so you need to see before you can um, assess? Yes, before we can before we can issue a supplemental bill. That's the trigger. Oh, okay. Well, that's certainly an idea we need to look at, right? But it, it doesn't increase the amount of assessment. It just accelerates, accelerates it. Assessment. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Um, last two are idea 391, allow hotels and B&Bs and bylaws. And the last idea, which is actually a, a like different that, category. Uh, not doing that this fall, right? But it's on, no, on the horizon. No, no. I, I was very ambitious and wanted to deal with hotels this fall. Yeah. Was, uh, was advised to uh, be rational. <laughs> but, it, but it's something that, that we're considering, so we're right? Hoping, we're hoping springtime meeting can okay. look at it. Okay, all right, um, good. And that the planning board wisely pointed out that there were some wrinkles that I hadn't considered. So their process takes time. It, it does for good reason. So I, I guess what I would like to say is I think we're all committed to hotels and BABs as a permissible use. And even though special town meeting won't consider it this fall, we're really, really hoping. Yeah, I agree. I support that. Spring. I do. I think we need a nice hotel in town. So the last idea on our list is uh, 413 DLS recommendations on form of government. This idea was not scored by the Structural Change Impact Group. I think we, in our consideration of it, we couldn't come up with the grading for it, how much financial benefit was from it. But in our committee, in the Structural Change Implementation Committee, looking at this, we felt this was like major structural impact, um, looking at all the different um, ways we could reform the form of government in town. And it so, coincided a lot with the Collins Center. Absolutely. I was just, that came Collins out. Everybody right, said, if we don't fix our structure, we can't fix our finances. Right. So DLS is the Division of Local Services of the Department of Revenue. I think we're moving on a number of these, as Elizabeth yeah. indicated. Um, and, you, and, we, and I met with uh, Paul and Vicki and said, I think we are making, making progress on a number of these. On some we haven't quite um, sort of engaged on. Um, is, is the work continuing with the committee? I mean, so we're sort of wondering what our next step is at yeah. this point. Yeah, okay. Beyond delivering these, I mean, we've, we've gone through the report again. Um, for Paul and I, it was deja vu because we were part of right. the first group. Um, and um, just really understanding after this report um, what our next steps should be. I, I'm throwing out an idea. Um, either once we're already making progress, maybe look at these ideas where we're making progress, just let us keep perking along. But if they're like, I think we, I need to know more about the supplemental tax assessment or more about uh, the, tr um, the transfer tax or the transfer fee. So there's some that, that were not in process that I think we need to know more about before we could put them into process. So that actually would be quite helpful for me is if you could at some point brief us. I mean, I guess I can go back and read the report certainly. Yeah, I, I think yeah. the other thing in Lisbon is shared. These are all live links in the report that was This would have shared a lot of information on uh, pilot payments, and I've been thinking about that since 2010. I've been on the board. Uh, and there's a lot of guidance that's out there. I, mean, I think, I don't know how you do this, right? But what what other, what towns have been successful in implementing pilot? I mean, clearly Cambridge, Watertown, Boston. Mark, Mark can, I, can I step back? Yeah, sure. I think we've agreed that the most important thing we're going to do is start the, the ask is going to come from the select board in a consistent, clear fashion. Um, that, that has not happened in the past. I, I think we've agreed that the select board is going to take over the pilot request. Okay, got it. And why that's critically important is I frankly don't expect. Well, I agree with that. I don't expect it to result in any payments immediately, but we start to build a record. I mean, right now, these organizations can say, well, have you asked us? Uh, and so, you know, we can say they're not paying pilot, but they can they can throw it right back at us. So we need to start asking and build a record of them saying no. I think it's helpful. I think it's helpful. It's helpful. And I agree with that, that we should sort of, I, I agree that we need to show that that type of leadership on this issue. Uh, other than having a meeting and say you need to pay pilot, how do we go about sort of, uh, we, we how do you really, execute on that? What's the value? What's the approach yeah. you take? That's what I'm asking here. So I think we're starting with very gross value of 25% of what the assessed would be. Is that common? I don't know. That's the point. So I could dig up. Dan Holston had written part of a report that we were never able to finish because the Board of Assessors never, never gave us the final information that we needed. Um, but I could go back and look. He is about as he knows. Dan Holston knows as much as anybody on this because he helped negotiate the, the Boston pilots. Um, and Dan, I'm sure, would come in and be willing to talk with us again. So Dan had partially authored when I was chairing the, the property tax working group. We authored one report 
on senior tax relief on which um, the board of assessors did not take action. And then we were trying to get the second um, piece, which was pilot. Um, and again, we're not able to get all the information that we wanted. And we've, we've been in a waiting pattern for years on this and it's just time to stop waiting. Our first ask will be imperfect, but it will start the process. And we will refine our asks as time goes on. And if at some point we move to um, an appointed board of assessors, then I expect we'll get a lot more cooperation than we've had. One thing I want to raise a, 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 a success, something to celebrate, idea 318, which is about street lights, dimming street lights, which was an anonymously, we, we can't even credit who, somebody anonymously posted this to the website and said, maybe we should dim the street lights. And it's actually- I love that idea. Up. So. Well, the, between the LEDs and then the dimming of the LEDs, that certainly has, absolutely. Well, just, nobody needs a street light at 2 a.m. to be as bright as. No. Right, exactly. It's really annoying. When you look at so thank you who, to whoever did that. <laughs> may, may I offer a suggestion just from a staff perspective? Sure. Uh, so just, um, I, I think there were, there was a huge number of, of really actionable ideas within the report, and it's just frustrating to not have the time to be able to track things down. Um, and it's also, it's as, as a committee, if these are areas that are deemed that the, the select board would like to act on and the staff don't maybe don't have time to, to track down the, like the further ideas and the further questions and things, if the committee could decide on, if, we, if you could give some direction to the committee about which ones in particular you'd like them to review, then they can, perhaps you could do some further research on that and then help drive the, the suggestions that are coming up to town meeting or to the select board or whomever else as a is it would be better if it was coming from a resident as opposed to staff too from that perspective so i noted the 275 and 378 the real estate transfer mm -hmm. fees and the supplemental tax assessment were ones that you wanted to know more about a little bit more about there paul right um, if I'm going through increased revenues from grants, that's really contingent on being able to hire a, a grant writer and administrator. Um, yeah, it's also having the staff to manage and administer the grant. Well, that's what I mean. A person who would be dedicated to overseeing that. We just we don't have the staffing, but but that comes up all the time. I, I think it's something that hopefully we can find. You know, if you have hard passes, hopefully that's a staff position that we can um, create. The question is always whether. The cost of that right. is justified by the benefit you can get. Well, and, and the challenge that we're running into is sometimes the grants are so specific that we can't actually, like we ended up giving up the grant that we'd received for the Pleasant Street crosswalk because it, it was so entailed that, that it ended up not serving our purposes. Um, let's see. Uh, I, think that, I think that makes sense, Jennifer. Um, at least those two, Paul and Vicki. I, I would like going to. Going through the ideas again. And just, I'm sorry. Let's no, go ahead. I interrupted you. Please finish. Uh, I'm just going through these ideas again. Maybe there's others here. I mean, one of the things that we haven't quite done, I don't know how we go about doing this, and it's challenging is looking at you know, ways to have continue to collaborate with surrounding communities through intermissional agreements. Regionalization is a great buzzword. It doesn't really hard to execute on. And mean, there, are some, there are some drawbacks to them as well. Yeah, right. It's mean, great. But are there other, I mean, I know you spent a lot of time, you guys met a number of times to go through there and pick out these 12 ideas. Are there others in here that would result, that would need additional research um, and drilling down into that you've presented to the select board for it to execute on? Beyond the 12 that you've gone through? I don't think they need additional, I mean, we've, yeah. we've reviewed them. It's not additional work. It's not additional research. It, it's, yeah. it's, okay. it's more the, the logistical approach to um, to looking at how to bring them forward. And if you read through them or all of them, and this was the work of the study group, it all starts with the select board, the town administrator, the town treasurer, the police chief, the, five, the same people same who people. are so busy. Um, and and um, when we met with um, Patrice and Jennifer a few months ago and heard about you know, the openings that they're dealing with and so on, um, that's why we wanted to come to you um, and get some further direction because it all starts with leadership. Well, uh, looking at this list, I think we are actually uh, 
moving ahead on at least five of them. Um, so civil service uh, budget guidelines, which I think is largely complete. Yeah. Uh, town zoning, uh, a big piece of that is going to be addressed, I think, by the, the um, MBTA community's uh, work that's going on. Uh, pension liabilities is that's really a matter for largely for the retirement board. But I, I do want to add there that we have. Uh, I'm very excited about a most recent appointment to the retirement board, Brian Antonellis. I think um, he could be a game changer there in terms of bringing in excess administrative costs and uh, influencing um, a higher return on our, our fund. If, if in fact he can guide the board toward uh, fully dusting a print. So I'm, I'm excited about that appointment. Um, we, I think as a, we're doing what we can, but Roy's absolutely correct that well, they're independent of us. Um, GIC, uh, we actually, we're owed an update on GIC, aren't we, Patrice? Because we were waiting to see what the new plan design was going to be to see how it, uh, how advantageous it would really be. Yeah, that, that one is, might be a little bit more on the list. Um, that has all union implications and employee right. and stuff. So it's gonna take a little longer. Well, one reason uh, we were waiting on this is uh, GIC was going to change their own plan design this past summer, and then we would, we were going to take a look at it. But it's it's clearly part of the collective bargaining negotiations. Also, we've also made some progress on the DLS recommendations with the um, move to a higher treasurer because we're right, we have been been to not elect the treasurer. Right, that, that was going to be my next observation. Okay. <laughs> but I think, I think the I treasurer and, and, and we're Correct. giving a lot of thought to um, uh, proposing uh, an appointed uh, board of assessors. Uh, and I'm not sure that there's a lot of big picture um, need to change the form of government at that point. Because do, doing a town charter, I think, would be uh, a lengthy and laborious project, but I don't think it would achieve a whole lot more than what we will have gotten to by uh, dealing with the treasurer and the board of assessors. I think that may be why the, because there was, I think it was in our subcommittee of the structural change impact group where we couldn't score it. And it's because of how do you, how do you score the impact of a, of a charter, you know? Well, but I do think if, if we're moving in the direction, what you do want is a finance team that is fully integrated. And the finance team is the finance director, the accountant, the treasurer, and the board of assessors. So we've got three out of the four, and presumably we'll ultimately get four out of the four. Well, if, if in terms of direction, I, I think it would be helpful. You know, various <laughs> committees have come to the select board arguing for grants or a grant seeker of one form or another. If, if you could compile a list of uh, potential uh, significant grant opportunities. I think that would be helpful to know. And, they, and they could, part of the problem with a grant writer is that uh, these grants can come from many different directions uh, to identify you know, where they are, what they are, and find a grant writer, writer with enough expertise to write the grant is uh, also- Well, there is an opportunity to contract on that service as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that, that yeah. it, it's-, it's <coughs> It's not only sort of getting the grant, but it's also um, and administering, administering, right. yeah, right, which is a, which is our issue, of course. Mm -hmm. But if you could take a first step at even identifying what grants might be of interest, okay. um, and how you, I would think, contracting on the service so that someone that you can contract with without hiring someone to do this work, okay, it gives you flexibility. That is, the contract service is done on a uh, return on investment type of yeah. situation, yeah. whereby. If you hire someone to apply for grants and you don't get the grant, well, then that's just a, that's just a fixed cost that you incur without receipts in return, right? Right. But in a contract service, I think there are contract grant. Um, there are services for that you can contract for for grants that is on a commission basis, if you will, to the extent that they get a grant and they're paid for that sort of success. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, and that's definitely out there. And that's one of the things that we came across during when we were studying that particular yeah, idea. That yeah. key. So that, that, that whereby there's no cost to the town, there's a benefit, although the, the commission that you pay it does reduce the amount to some extent the grant, but then you've gotten a grant that well, you otherwise wouldn't have gotten. Let, let me be a um, 
remind people we're about an hour and 10 minutes behind. Yeah, that's fine. So, so we give you some take that list and it would also be helpful if, if you could identify- Only an hour and 10? Wow. If you could identify towns that have actually imposed real estate transfer fees, who they are and the magnitude and what the car out further, that, that would be useful. And what the process was that they yeah. went through to do it. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, Paul, we'll end up something very quick because we. Need I, I just have a question: Is there a reason why the soccer bubble was left off? Of but let's the... let's skip that. You can deal with it. If you want to bring up the soccer bubble, talk about it. We're going to build that. Let, 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 we need Don't to move on. Cost of a soccer bubble. Where are you going to put it? Uh, we need we need to move on, guys. We're not going to talk about the soccer. <laughs> Thank bubble. you. Thank you, Paul. But okay. I'm not certain where that would go. <laughs> okay, we are up to the list of draft warrant articles for special town meetings. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting idea, but I no, let's, know let's, please let's it. move on from. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is the current list right now. So this is the this is a draft, very draft uh, warrant with the current list of. This articles. is a very draft warrant. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have some. Is this different than what we looked at before. Well, it has wording attached to it, but this is the wording. List. Um, there is one additional article from the last time I think you've seen this, and which is an opioid appropriation. Jennifer's been working with the police chief, the fire chief, and the board of health director to come up with some projects to use that opioid money that we that, that's on page six. Yeah, know. that we appropriated um, back in the spring. So that's the only additional article you see. All right. Well, this looks like a a very full uh, three nights. Uh, I'm hoping that the uh, the citizens' petitions for board of assessors will um, be moved to a January town meeting, but that's that's a subject. You mean a special discussion. town meeting in January? Yes, and I think to make to it fully remote. To be fully and to make it real. Be uh, what? I'm sorry. Fully remote. Fully remote. I'm saying. No different than how we did the treasury meeting. And what I, what I would like the board to do actually is to declare a special town meeting. Or January. I'm fine with that. I think that makes fun before sense. the November town meeting. So um, know because you know, right now I'm not on board with that, and I think um, I need further information on this. Yeah. Great, and I think we could use a dedicated uh, public forum on that in, earlier in January. This I support that. The treasurer, because I think yeah. it was productive to do it that way for the treasurer. I I am willing to. It's a full I'm, night of debate. I, I support calling a special town meeting. I do agree that it's it's a significant change in our structure of governance, and I do think it deserves attention. If we commit to it early January, but is it our decision to do that? We, we can call petition? a special town meeting. No, we, well, we, no we, 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 we can call a special town meeting and, and hopefully, commit. Okay, hopefully the it. sponsors of the citizens petition right. would agree to. Let's, let's do that, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, just quickly, Article One. We had a total of five off-cycle funding requests. Uh, I'm hopeful that we'll narrow that down to two. Oh. So. Um, I will, I will spell you the detail, unless you want to hear it now, but I can also give it a little No, bit. that's fine. So, um, okay. When, you, when is CPC meeting? Uh, second Wednesday in October, 5.30 p.m. So is that the 11th? Yeah, so we'll know when we sign the warrant, what yeah. the final ones are. Right. How many zoning bylaws? Just one? Restaurants? Yep. Yeah, the planning board had talked about signage, but it sounds like they didn't pursue that right now, so we can... As long as I think, Elizabeth, we're still, I support all of the things that have been mentioned, that we continue to move forward in some way on those. I, I think as long as we tell people in good faith we're moving forward. Okay. So I think um, we need to show progress in that way. We absolutely have to show progress. Um, yeah, okay. I, I don't think the, vote, the voters will not tolerate anything. I else. agree. Mr. Chair, we're committed to leaving civil service on as well. I think civil service should remain, and Agreed. there may be some news about civil service later this evening. I'm not sure. I also agree that it's it's going to be a tough debate. We need to have that debate. It, it's I'm committed to it. Debate. I think it's a public safety. I have a public safety yeah. concern. I think we're somewhat in a crisis. I mean, police departments all over the country are, are experiencing shortages, and the same as us, and we need to address it. Well, and, and when we had our public forum on this question, we were asked. Uh, for some information and for some specific uh, actions. And I, I think we'll be able to satisfy those asks before town meeting. Okay. When do we have to vote? So we're signing the warrant on October 13th. Oh, that morning. We, we have uh, a final that meeting scheduled. That morning? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. And then you'll have un other meetings to take positions. Okay. Um, anything else to say about 
How many articles? Uh, no, this will be working to yeah. finalize language. Okay, good. And it's three nights, Patricia? <laughs> I think so. I hope so. Four nights. No. All right. Uh, next item is FY25 uh, budget update and preliminary budget. Let's just put the preliminary bylaw amendments. amendments. What about what those? Zoning bylaw amendments, Chair? Oh, sorry. What is that? <laughs> I was, I was... Given that we've had a uh, public change, we do we so we can next. What's the next item? We can, do, we can change. The bylaw. Wait, what are we talking about? Uh, 10J. Sorry, by law amendment. Yeah, Taylor, the Taylor's here for that. This is restaurant on the agenda. Yeah. Taylor and Paul are here for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They've been sitting here for an, an hour and a half. Yes. Yeah. They're here to discuss the article. And yeah, now. please. Yeah. But I tell you, uh, Taylor um, and Paul, my major question for you is uh, where does it stand with the planning board? Because I think we would only discuss this in detail after hearing from the planning board. Sure. So we uh, presented to the planning board last, or, uh, Taylor Yates, chairman of the uh, Vision 21 Implementation Committee. Uh, we presented to the planning board last week. Uh, we, the planning board's going to hold a meeting on the 10th. Public with, hearing. Public hearing, excuse me. Uh, public hearing on the 10th because that falls within the window of, uh, you know this better than I do, Patrice, of like yeah, sufficient, sufficient to um, public comment time or <laughs> and within the warrant window. So under under the mass general law, the planning board has to hold a public hearing, close the public hearing and vote on it prior to town meeting. So the 10th is right before the warrant closes, which is on the 13th. So once they approve that final language, that final language will go on the warrant that you sign on the 13th. Um, and will, then will the planning board vote on the 10th as well. They would have to vote on the 10th for it to make it to the warrant. Chris is also here. Chris Ryan, the town planner. Um, hey, Chris, how are you? Yeah. Also, Taylor. Taylor is a member of the planning board. Uh, yes. So we can at least speak to discussions that have happened so far there. Great. There actually hasn't been a lot of discussion. We've basically presented them. We've we presented the uh, the amendments that were drawn up by the consultant the town hired. Um, so they received like the fully worded versions of uh, of our proposed amendments. So they'll be, you know, considering them, holding a public hearing on them, and voting on them on the town. Mm -hmm. So is the planning board in possession of the language now, or are you going to? Yes. Say, okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yep. And so we as well. We need. Is it? Not, we need support from them, or we just need their point of view. They have to vote on it. They have to. They have to have the public hearing, and then they have to make a recommendation to town meeting. And they and they they may modify it. So. So uh, they may modify. Yeah. Yep. So they may modify. So we have enough time if if they vote on it on the tenth. If if they don't, can they do that? Yeah. So, yeah. Patrice, what's the process of if the planning board? Let's assume there's a a um, favorable vote by the planning board on some language. Mm -hmm. There could still then be um, additional amendments filed by the. That's public. correct. Yeah, that's correct. And what's the time? Because we would then have to vote on any amendments that are yes i believe amendments are due november 1st okay. so i believe that's two weeks after you would be signing the warrant thereabouts maybe a week amendments from whom members of the public of the who don't like who don't like this who change. don't like the change well who, not awesome. not necessarily the change but just the details because it's you know oh, it has deep. yeah uh i so i just you want me to Sorry. Well, in this pro I'll just make one comment. In this process, we've tried to be pretty attentive to the will of the voters. Like, there are definitely things that were proposed in our brainstorming and idea development process that we ultimately turned away from because we just felt that, like, Belmontonians didn't want it. And I think one of the most important, um, one of the most important things that we did in our proposed amendment is addressing chain restaurants. So, uh, a no the zoning bylaw takes an oblique approach to chain restaurants by requiring special permits or prohibiting certain kinds of restaurants <clears throat> but there's actually a much better way to do it that we have taken in our amendment approach which is uh, towns are allowed to regulate what are called formula-based food service establishments <clears throat> and you can't prohibit them and that is that is a violation of the u.s constitution's equal protection clause but you can require a special permit and that they have to meet certain community goals in order to open 
uh, in town. So we have brought that language into our amendments and into, and you know, if they're approved, it'll be brought as a zoning bylaw so that we can much more uh, clearly regulate what we feel is a very strong concern of voters. Paul Joy, <laughs> Paul Joy, Chair of the EDC. And in some respects, this is actually a little bit more restrictive on, on chain restaurants, especially those that might have been able to open by right within certain business districts. Mm -hmm. This proposal is actually going to require them to, because they're a formula-based food service establishment, to be basically required to go through a special permit as opposed to being allowed by right. Yeah, I, I suspect a lot of the discussion from the public may be um, more on the criteria that are being proposed for the special permit review more than the uh, yeah. mm -hmm. than the, the uses and maybe, themselves. Maybe some of the issues around parking as well, right? Yeah. Well, let me back up and say just I, I have had sort of a front row seat to the process that Paul and Taylor have gone through. It's been very thorough. It's been very thoughtful. Um, and I do think that the formula-based language is much more clear. A major problem, a major problem there's only by law is that it's confusing and internally contradictory and nobody knows how to get from A to Z. So if nothing else, you've certainly provided some clarity that I think everybody will welcome. Right. Mm -hmm. Can I ask Chris, uh, Chris, I mean, in terms of working with the planning board, um, how, how we, I think, so they're meeting on the 10th. We, we'd like to see if, um, a positive vote from them. In what way are you going to be working with them, Chris, to sort of walk them through the changes here and informing them about, you know, the changes and how it maybe aligns towards what other communities? Yeah, what, one of the things that uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to provide them with a, uh, a board report that uh, sort of summarizes what each of the amendments is intended to do. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, the, the two representatives from the two committees that put this together, I think did a very good job of, of explaining that. But I, I think uh, just providing it in a succinct language that uh, we can get through in a very short period of time. Um, and also maybe talking about how other communities have approached these issues. I think uh, the parking um, measure is, is probably the most cut and dried. Um, I think obviously doing their research on uh, our surrounding communities was very helpful in that regard. Uh, I think the formula business um, model, um, I'm familiar with what Concord has done, uh, limiting formula businesses. They, they did it in a slightly different way. Uh, they limited, they had a cap um, for both West Concord and Concord Center. Um, this approach is a little bit different, might be a little bit less uh, a, a issue related to uh, attorney general approval. So uh, I think it probably has a, a greater chance of uh, not being scrutinized in a negative way by the attorney general. Uh, and I think I have a great deal of, um, uh, you know, respect for Russell Burke as a uh, planning consultant. I think he did a remarkable job in uh, helping this group put this together. Thank you, Chris. Sounds good. All right. All right. I think the main thing for us is to wait and see what comes out of the planning board. And then we'll move quickly on. Please so. vote. And then one other thing, the EDC is committed to holding some type of a public hearing, assuming a favorable planning board oh. action the week after. The week of before town meeting, that's great, Paul. Before the oh, before town meeting, and then the other thing that the EDC is going to do, and they're hopefully voting on it tonight, is the business reception in the center. And so we'll certainly be talking about it with business owners at that particular event. I'm planning that's October third, correct? October third. Yeah, I have it. Tonight. Tonight. I have it in my, to be there. I have it in my calendar. Um, and just again, thank you. This this has significance beyond just restaurants. This is an incredibly important signal to Belmont as a town and to our small businesses of the direction that we're committed to going uh, and to residents. So thank you for all your work. It, it's, it's got magnitude beyond just restaurants. I think this will really serve as a model for how we do with, we deal with a lot of our business resolution. Okay, any other comments you'd like to make at this point? It's good to see you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah. see you tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for not giving up on us. All right, thank you again. We appreciate your efforts. Uh, Okay, uh, next item is discussion and vote to approve a one-day liquor license, uh, beer and wine. Move to open. approve a one-day liquor. Can I just add something? So this is, if you look at the date, it's October 7th, so you're not meeting before then. We received everything but sign off from the Board of Health, if you can make that. Contingent. So conditional? Yeah, contingent on the Board of Health. Sign. Board of Health approval? Mm -hmm. Okay, move to approve one-day liquor license, beer and wine only, right? For a wedding at the First Church, October 7, 2023, from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m., contingent on 
Approval from the Board of Health. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we're still looking at our liquor license rates. Yeah, Pam was compiling that. Okay. This is, uh, we will definitely have something for you by December. Right you wanted a comparison, right? I just, I just should, are we in line? Should we be raising these? And it's not that I want to be inappropriate, but we should be in line with our surrounding communities. Okay. So, no, recognizing all these things that, that the fees are supposed to be cost-based, so. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't think they cover our costs right yeah. now. So, they don't come close. Ew. All right. Um, that brings us to the finally to the um, FY25 budget update. Uh, yes. So, um, in addition to the public forum that's happening on Thursday, uh, we are going to be starting our convers some conversations with the, the warrant committee on uh, Wednesday. And we've put together a preliminary revenue projection for FY25. So, I wanted to share it with you and see if you had any thoughts or feedback on it before we brought it to the warrant committee. Uh, I read through it as incredibly thorough, incredibly helpful. We missed receiving these last year. I'm glad that the current treasurer has uh, re-implemented these. Um, it's really important. So, thank you to Leslie. What's happened, sir? What we, happened? The Warrant Committee did not receive these detailed reports last year. Well, so this is a no, this, is the revenue, this, this is, is uh, yeah. this is the revenue projection that, that I'm we're looking at the at the Q4 moment. Uh, it's the Q4 part is the the next oh, the next right. item so on the Q4 agenda, Q4 right? So I haven't really read through this in detail, so it looks really well thorough and, and well constructed. And this is just preliminary in nature in terms of what 25 is looking like. Absolutely. Revenue. 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 Yeah, sorry, I was talking ahead. Like I had gone through all of this, and I was like, oh, it's beautiful data. Okay. I love this data. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So this is just been craving data. This is just um, preliminary and um, 147 million projected revenue at this point, right? Right. I mean, and that there are a lot of moving pieces at this point. There's assumptions around what the the exempt debt service would be in light of. We'll clearly know that before we before we finalize. There's some other you know moving pieces. I think just you know jumping ahead slightly to FY24, you know what we how we ended FY23. Awesome. Um, three the. Um, one of the areas where we exceeded expectations was an investment income. And we're expecting, you know, because the federal, um, the Fed just started increasing rates, you know, um, midpoint last summer or even in, in the early fall. And so the, uh, the town's accounts were adjusted partway through. And so we're looking to update our, our revenue projections. And I'll be doing, we're putting a fine pencil on that to, to project for FY25. Will be um, this particularly as well, where we're issuing, um, we're going to be issuing debt. So, with if we have the bonds on hand, I can compare that to where we, you know, what we're expect, how we're expected to spend it. And just so, just to back up a little, the investment income that we budget or estimate um, in revenue year to year, that that number is, has been traditionally given to us by the treasurer. Um, it's usually a standing line that's about two hundred fifty thousand. Um, we didn't receive any other um, information, and it stayed at two hundred fifty thousand. So the investment income is definitely um, a number to watch. So uh, one other, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. One other quick comment. Um, I know we don't. We have, we do not have an Airbnb policy. I think we shut Airbnb down what five or six years ago. Or I don't remember what we did, but it, uh, I've been hearing from friends that Airbnb still goes on. And at some point, I think when we deal with hotels bed breakfast, we also need to look at Airbnb because if that is happening in town, you know, potentially it's something where we need to come up with a rational regulation, but for Pete's sake, we should at least be getting um, our share of, of taxes from that or, or fees or revenue. Yeah, so. there's been some discussions in the past about yeah. Airbnb. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at this real quickly. So in terms of local receipts, it's gone down, right? Um, well, then one of the... Three. One of the main reasons that it would be going down is that we are taking recreation out yep. of uh, the general fund, and oh. so that would be that would be we transitioning. It it'll be transitioning to a revolving fund. Oh, I see. Okay. And so yeah, as a result, the yeah, I remember seeing that, and that was. Oh, yeah. is that the is that the departmental municipal? Exactly. That's yeah. Exactly. Million. Yeah. million from twenty. 
four. Those are previous more than nine. Those are five. previous conversations about whether or not to have a revolving fund versus an enterprise, and we decided to do a revolving fund first. So that's where. No, I'm that's fine. Go. And the investment income, as you indicated, uh, we had one point one last year for just placeholder five hundred thousand. That's exactly right. We'll be needing okay. to time that. I mean, everything else is pretty formulaic, right? But also the one point one outline. What are we using for new growth? Eight, six, eight. Same same number. The same number. What was new growth in twenty three? with an end of the year? At this point, uh, the assessors are due to update that uh, at, by the end of this week and have okay. it submitted to the state. So we'll work with them. We need sense of the use of more and the use of Warren community go through this in detail way, right? Well, we'll be presenting it and we'll see what kind of questions that they that they have around it. I have a feeling. This we'll Wednesday, right? Really, uh, I think it is, but I think sort of the the bottom line. Uh, big picture number to explain is the uh, 20 FY 25 revenue total uh, general fund revenue calculation at the bottom of page four is down by over three and a half million dollars from the main reason for that is that we that we're not using we're only projecting two million in free cash at this point. yeah I think that just needs to be explained yeah it does. absolutely mm -hmm. and with, what did you do in state aid Flat, for state, line. It's, a, it's pretty, pretty much, much a minimum line. aid for the Chapter 70, and then it's a 2%, I believe, for the un, um, Unres undesignated. Res general government aid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, strictly. At this point, I mean, it's too early in the year to ask for guidance from our state legislators on that, right? I believe it is, although I'm very curious about how on the state, any further implementation of Chapter are. 70. Yeah, from a, I think their revenues were trending downward. I think it's, pretty, it's too low. Have you, yeah. have you read that? That, that we're experiencing some. I haven't seen any of the monthly mm -hmm. updates. I haven't okay, been, fine. I haven't noticed. The moving parts are uh, state aid, uh, free, use of free cash, and I guess to some extent local receipts. That's right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, otherwise, I think it looks fine to present. Welcome on Wednesday, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, next item is a fourth quarter update. Oh, that's. that's good. Good. Mm -hmm. There we go. So, so again, this is again, um, we, this is our very preliminary, I have to say, uh, the town accountant closed FY23 on Friday, and we're still working through the detailed balance sheet that um, we are hoping to, to submit sometime in October. Uh, the auditors are going to be in the week of, uh, of Columbus Day. So we are still working to clean up some of the uh, the backup, you know, information. So these things could certainly change. So I definitely just want to make that clear. But um, as of just that, the high point is that revenues we collected um, almost 2.1 million above what our initial what our projections were. And how does that come about? Yeah, good question. Well, the, the main one uh, is investment income, and four, uh, it was 1.1 million uh, more than what we had originally projected, and 400,000 of that was from the extra funding that we had due to the high school, where we had issued all that those bonds uh, in advance. So that that may or may not recur, and that's the part that I'm going to need to be putting a fine pencil on. Uh, in terms of, you know, there's definitely a lot more discussions have. on investment income and how that gets estimated on a year to year basis. You see, uncollected, what is that? I don't see what you mean. That know. means that we collect, it's not uncollected, it's a, it's a double negative. If that's exactly it means right. It's a collected overage. Yes. So it's a good number. It's a double negative. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. <laughs> what if the exercise was up? Um, Motor vehicle is excise. That is one again so where that's it's two million in excess of what we budgeted. That's correct. So that's goes to free cash. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. I I also want to preface and Jennifer and I have talked about this. You know, COVID did you know change was a game changer for estimation estimating revenue, and we're definitely seeing us coming out of that every year. So. And if I could, when I when I started, I ended up restating some of the FY23 projections um, based on FY22 actuals at that point. Um, and the goal, if you recall, was that the Department of Revenue prefers that we are moderately conservative. And so the goal is to not we don't want to we don't want to be overly concerned, overly aggressive and then find ourselves short because we we, surprise is not nasty surprise. Exactly, exactly. So, um, and I think the problem is, is that we normally look back at our prior 
year, you know, we look in the mirror to see you know, the rearview mirror to see what had happened, and COVID was immediately behind us, and so it's hard to know exactly how quickly we're going to be coming out of that. Motor vehicles excise is a perfect example where. People, even if they wanted to buy cars, were having a difficulty buying them because of the supply chain issues and the right. shortages and things um, like that. Too, so, mm -hmm. yeah. so, uh, so that's that's a direct impact on that. So, what's the non recurring one time two forty five? What was that? Um, a good portion of that, we we got some rebates from manufacturers. There are just other other areas. It's, it's a miscellaneous area we can definitely cannot but so a, a little bright spot was the other excise meals i mean if we're getting that much more meals tax hopefully that means the restaurants start recovering that's right <clears throat> absolutely that's a great point that's actually re that's actually rebounded above to yeah. where we yeah. were pre yeah, that's, that's great because that the, mm -hmm. the, the outside dining I was going to bring it back. <laughs> Never give up, Mark. No. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Expenditures? Uh, yes. Okay. 2.4 turnbacks on expenditure. Mr. Chair, will you yeah. put briefly on that? Uh, right. Um, and as you see, that there, it, it kind of goes across. It runs the gamut. Um, With just briefly, benefits, reserves, and uh, public services were two bigger ones. Right. So the benefits and reserves, I think that was more in that we had budgeted higher levels for health insurance and than okay. we actually needed. And then for public services, I think it, we benefited from not having a bad snow year um, in particular. And, uh, and But just so quick, the benefits also get generated for the vacancies. So if obviously we don't have the position filled. Then Understood. Can, yeah. Yes. And the schools are turning back for almost $500,000. You know, on that one, I, I think I need to really put an asterisk on that one. And I, I really don't want to speak for the schools. So. Um, Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm all set, Mr. Chair. All right, great. This will be revisited in more detail Wednesday night. So. And it will also be part of the free cash analysis once. Well, I mean, the way I'm looking at this is that we have two, two, two million plus in turnbacks on the expense side, and perhaps two million overages on the receipt side. Uh, so, Certainly four to four to four and a half million of dollars of opportunities you go to free cash. Yeah, great, thank you. Well done. Okay, so Bill Anderson, sorry, I'm gonna we're, we're so late. I'm gonna move on, and I, I hope you can save your question for Wednesday night because everything from the last two topics is fair game for the Warren Committee on Wednesday. All right, resignations, um, and move on to resignations. Yes, um, I move to accept the resignation of Heidi Workersham from the Youth Commission. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can we just put point to it. Yeah, there's she something wrong with these. Did we just point her to it? No, uh, I. No. No. I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe we didn't. She, she apparently has moved out of town. That's okay, fine. Place, so. uh, please take me off this list as I don't want to live in Toronto. Okay, thank you, Heidi, for your service. Move to accept the resignations of Aurora Santeliz from the education. Did we just appoint her? We did, but she wanted to be appointed to another committee, so we're appointing her to a different committee. <laughs> she, she applied for- This is like a revolving door on committee. I know, we appointed her. So we disappoint her, now we're removing her. But yeah, uh, that's fine. Well, thank you, Aurora, for your service on the ex well, education. So she's committee. about to render on the <laughs> next committee. Well, did she serve at all? I mean, for a day, a week? Uh, Move to accept the resignation of Aurora Sanfeliz from the Education College Committee. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, and then we now come to town administrator review. Is Kelly going to be part of No, Mitch is in Mitch is here. Oh, Mitch. Right. Mitchell, you've been sitting Mitch. there quite some time. It's great to see you. How are you? Doing well. Good to see all of you. Good to see you as well, my friend. I apologize for the late hour, but no problem. He doesn't mind. Not at all. Are you well? How are things doing upstairs? Well. We're busy as always, but yeah. we're, we're doing well. I'm sure you're doing great work up there. Yeah. Um, you want him to summarize? Uh, yeah, so we, uh, just so everybody in the public knows. A lot of inconsistent. Uh, Rainy's here. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> we, were, we were surprisingly consistent. Consistently. Yeah. Uh, in, yeah. Uh, so, Trace's contract is, actually remind me where we are, Mitch. This is, this is the annual review. This is the it's not wow. a renewal of Patrice's contract, but it's the annual review to arrive at a merit right. increase for Patrice. Correct, right. And so there's a performance review. As part of that, uh, Patrice submitted uh, a self evaluation, and then each of us on the select board filled out um, our own evaluation. It is amazing how consistent we were. 
Well, uh, so Mitch, why don't you summarize uh, the evaluation? That's a good sign. Sure thing. Um, the three of you, the select board members, evaluate Patrice on a five point scale. Um, overall, just to summarize, um, she received an average of, of a five, oh, excuse me, a 4.79. Um, Could you go through the categories, please? Sure. I mean, I know what they are, but I mean, for the residents. So we had our first category was personal characteristics. Then our second category was on professionalism. The third category. Grades for each, please. Sure thing. Yeah. Average rating. Sure. So the first category is personal char characteristics. Uh, Roy uh, rated that as a five. Mark rated it as a five. And Elizabeth rated it as a five. And that's out of five points. The second category is professionalism. Uh, Roy rated that as a five, Mark as a five, and Elizabeth as a five. Mitch, the average is fine. The average is fine. Just the average, average rate? The average, yeah. Okay. All right. Great, thank you. Okay. So the third category, so for those previous two categories, it's a five. <laughs> and then the, uh, the third category is public relations and communications, and the average was a four. Um, the fourth category was select board support and relations, and that was a five. The fifth category was community leadership. That was 4.5. The sixth category was organizational leadership and personal management. That was a five. And the seventh category was financial management, and that was a five. And then that yielded a overall average rating, as I said, of a 4.7. Oh, excuse me, that's not the bottom. So planning and organization was a 4.83. And then the overall was, as I said, a 4.79. And I, um, I think it'd be useful also for you to read the, uh, some of the overall comments by each of the three board members. Sure thing. So the overall comments from Roy are as follows. So recognize strengths, finance, administration, staff development, responding to an incredible range of management problems every day, excellent personal skills, receptiveness to suggestions from others, quick learner, and huge broad body of practical experience to guide our decisions. Areas of improvement. There are consistent challenges in Belmont of channeling conflicting priorities of different constituencies into a positive outcome for the town as a whole. This is more art than science. Patrice has grown enormously in this area and there will always be room for further growth. Overall comments, um, I have the highest regard for Patrice. Not everyone in Belmont realizes the demands put upon the town administrator and how difficult it is to be successful in this role. She is extraordinarily devoted and tireless in her efforts to make the town run well for the residents and employees. I observe this every day and believe she is one of the foremost practitioners in her field. So that was Roy's comments. And next we have Mark. So recognize strengths. Patrice displays a strong commitment and dedication to her role as town administrator of Belmont. She continues to provide highly effective and dedicated support to members of the select board. She has built a strong financial team and has strong financial skills that resulted in a balanced FY24 budget that addressed many of the service gaps and needs within our town. Areas of improvement, Patrice should continue her strong efforts in public relations and communication with the residents of our community look for ways to increase participation in the MMA, the Massachusetts Municipal Association, and in establishing relationships with town administrators and town managers within the state. Overall comments, Patrice performed at a very high level as our town administrator over the past year. And then um, Elizabeth Dion's comments are recognized strengths. I was elected as a change agent and I joined the select board with a long task list. Patrice has embraced this while simultaneously providing a realistic perspective on what we can accomplish in any given period of time and in what order. She is not afraid of change. She is not threatened by strong people around her and she is tough and resilient. You can learn a lot about someone by the people she hires. Patrice obviously has solid and well-deserved self-confidence. 
As a result, she has surrounded herself by smart and capable people, creating a truly impressive leadership team. Areas of improvement. Take more vacation time. <laughs> <laughs> I am very concerned about burnout. The town has been in crisis mode for a long time and Patrice has provided a steady hand at the tiller. But chronic overwork can result in poor decision making on a daily basis and lack of mental space for long term vision and planning. Overall comments. As a strong female leader, I personally feel that Patrice receives criticism from employees, unions, and certain members of the public that might not be leveled against a male in the same role. The select board needs to take a more active role in providing her with visible support and political cover. If we ask her to do difficult things, we need to take explicit responsibility for setting that agenda. At times, the select board could listen more closely and carefully to her when she expresses concerns or frustrations. The most important task of this coming year is a successful override from town voters. We will have to present a compelling case for additional reoccurring revenue while simultaneously presenting a fact-based case for significant cuts in town services that will accompany such a, such a failure. Information provided by the finance team will be central to making this argument. Those are the overall comments from the three select board members. I'm happy to share any of the other comments that you guys made in, in the other categories if you'd like me to. Yeah, Patrice, so you filled out your own self-assessment. <laughs> Is there anything you would like to add to this discussion? Um, I just want to thank the board um, for your comments and your feedback. Um, the fact that you scored me kind of similarly yeah. tells me that I'm doing the same thing for each of you, um, which is um, I can be I couldn't be more proud of um, that I serve you as the board. Um, I also wanted to talk about the team, the finance team, not only that, but also the team that I've been able to build in the six years that I've been here. I think, you know, as of uh, the hiring of Chris Ryan, the town planner, he's the last department head um, to fill the vacancies. And I think we have a really strong team. Uh, the addition of Jennifer was huge. Um, I can't tell you the um, the work that we've been able to do in a short period of time. It's been it's been amazing. Um, so I just I continue to look at ways to improve the town, to improve the departments, to improve the, the staff and the team. And you know I really enjoy working in Belmont, and I hope to continue. It's been great. And yeah, so thank you. You're welcome. You know, I think as when we, I served for chair for 15 months, and I think we, there was so much that was accomplished uh, together. And um, I'm very appreciative of the fact that you, um, even when I stepped down as chair, you, you're very good about informing all members of the board, taking our temperature, trying to align, you know, our points mm -hmm. of view, which can be difficult. You know, you, have, mm -hmm. you know, certain certain boards can be strong minded, which I think we are. And to align our, our, our points of view so that we can move forward in a positive way, I think, is, is a real strength. And I appreciate that your efforts as it relates to particularly the skating rink, which I think was really challenging for, for us at the time, and that we move that forward. And the quality of life in the community, I think, has benefited from that. And so I look forward to our continued work together. You're here. <laughs> The one thing that I'll add is enjoying the select board, and you know, Mark has been a member for so long, and and really as well. Um, <laughs> I'm asked to opine or make decisions on a lot of things where I don't have background and certainly no expertise. And what has been incredibly important for me in this role is trusting that Patrice will give me honest, unbiased information. Um, so I do feel that I can trust the information she gives me and then make a decision. And I've also really appreciated at times. We've made decisions that she might not have preferred or agreed with, but she is a team player and she rolls up her sleeves and implements what we ask her to do. So it is very clear that we set policy for the town. Um, and it's very clear that Patrice honors our role. At the same time, we rely heavily on her integrity and honesty in giving us information. So thank you. All right. Well, um, what we need to do now is enter into an executive session because we will. Um, uh, discuss a merit increase for Patrice for this year or this coming year. And I think we're also going in for the yeah. superior offices as well. Yes, there was an addition to the agenda so let me, regarding let me, superior Let me see if I can yeah. do a motion here. Uh, we'll okay. I move, and we're turning open session, right? Um, I move to um, move, I move to, uh, to 
going into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, uh, town administrator, and the Belmont Police Superior Offices Association. Second. Roll call. Elizabeth Dion, aye. Mark Flo, aye. Roy Epstein, aye. Okay, we will return to open session. Okay, I'd like to take a vote to uh, exit uh, executive session. So moved. Second. Roll call. Elizabeth Dion, aye. Mark Flo, aye. Roy Epstein, aye. So the first topic we discussed in the executive session was uh, a merit pay, a merit raise for town administrator Patrice Garvin, uh, reflecting the terms of her contract and the performance review that we discussed before we uh, broke last time. And after some discussion, uh, the three members of the board unanimously support a 3% merit increase uh, for Patrice. Uh, her contract runs until 2025. Three years from this January. 27. 27. So this is, the merit increase is something that we address each year during the contract and that's what we decided for this year. And I would add that um, we uh, did a check of her compensation as a uh, resulting from this increase against what other uh, town administrators and, and town managers are receiving. And we are comfortable that not only are we in range, but that in all likelihood, uh, Patrice is actually uh, a bit below the median. So we think it's fair reflecting the uh, effort that she puts into the job and reflects the realities of the market that we're working with. Also, the realities of the town's fiscal situation, where I think we would like to be a little closer to the median, but this isn't the time to uh, to do that, unfortunately, well, even though she might deserve it. To say that it, this was a number that was mutually agreeable. Um, uh, so with that, I'll move to approve a 3% merit increase for town administrator, Patrice Garvin. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the, and the second uh, topic we discussed in the executive session was a, a uh, contract with police superiors union and Patrice can give us a summary of that. Sure. So this past June, June 30th, the superiors uh, police union expired. Um, we received communication from the superiors to sit down and, and begin to negotiate. I am happy to report that we have a three year negotiated um, deal or memo of agreement with the superiors. Um, on July 1st of 2023, July 1st of 2024, July 1st of 2025, there'll be a 2% wage increase, um, what's commonly known as COLA. On July 1st, 2023, there's an increase of first responder stipend by 2.5%. On July 1 of 2024, there's an increase of first responder stipend of 2.5%. Um, we also did some wording um, adjustments within the contract. The town received bi-weekly pay um, when all the unions agree. We've been slowly working with each union to get us to that point. We believe that'll create a tremendous amount of efficiencies uh, within the payroll. And we also have given them an additional uh, year of uh, vacation, or I'm sorry, additional time of vacation after the 25th year. And then we fixed some longevity language that was uh, much needed uh, within uh, the contract. So this is great news. This is, um, as the chief and I were um, discussing in the executive session, uh, this is the quickest contract we've turned around um, since I've been here, since he's been chief. So very happy um, that the superiors have a three-year agreement. Thank you, Patrice. I think it also shows that um, the town and the unions can work very constructively and, and get this done. And, and just want to underscore that the prior contract expired only June 30th and it's it's uh, three months later. So that this yeah, is good work. Thank you. Really yeah, yeah. agree. This is uh, it's great. And from a financial perspective, um, you know, aligns with the current situation we're in. Also appreciate the union's efforts in making this happen. And as always, really grateful for our first responders and our police and our public safety personnel. Um, we appreciate you. So with that, I move to uh, ratify the uh, Belmont Police Superior Offices Association uh, Union contract as outlined by our town administrator, Patrice Carver. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. 
Uh, we have uh, really just uh, one other item, which is a donation from Cambridge Savings Bank. Uh, this is great. There's a network event on October 3rd, 2023. So thank you, Cambridge Savings Bank, for your support. Yeah, so it looks like this it's $1,500 that will support. That's a lot of catering uh, to the uh, Economic <laughs> Development Committee networking networking event on October 3rd. I believe it's going to be held at Patu. At Patu. Which is one of my favorite Thai restaurants I ever. I love Patu. We, yes, we do. Agreed. I have a lot yeah. to take out there. Yeah, we'll go there quite a bit. I move to accept a donation from the Cambridge Savings Bank in the amount of $1,500 for an Economic Development Committee networking event to be held on October 3rd, 2023. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Cambridge Savings Bank. Um, okay. The only remaining item is minutes. I just did not have time to review minutes, so I could wait until yeah. Thursday or our next okay. meeting. Uh, just as I mentioned, Roy, I made some minor changes, just correcting some names and both sets of minutes. So um, you can use, use my set when you're making changes. Uh, I will do that. Okay. That is very good. So is it? move to adjourn. Second. We are adjourned. Hi. Oh, that's uh, right. Yeah. And it is before eleven. It is before yeah, eleven. Everything. Well